we're live now, Chairman. OK, right, look, thank you all very much for attending this rather misty, moisty morning. Um, there's a lot happening in our lives. We're all waiting to find out who's going to be the uh, nominated president in January. Um, and uh, of course, this is the uh, first meeting on the county council with the lockdown. The second lockdown just started. So we are living in very strange days and <clears throat> having done a lockdown before it's you know, the novelty factor has now worn off and I think most of us are probably getting a bit tired of it. But that being the case, we've got quite a uh, an interesting uh, meeting coming up. I'll just do this very quickly. Um, um, but I'll tell you the timings of it when I do my chairman's opening remarks. Uh, can we start with, can you all mute please? That's the first thing. Uh, I'll begin by reading the names of the members on the committee. Um, and could you then unmute and uh, tell me that you're here and present, okay? Um, obviously, you know myself, Councillor Jonathan Glenn. We, we have, uh, do we have Councillor Keith Evans? OK, do we have Councillor Adam Carew? We have apologies from Fran Carpenter. Uh, uh, Councillor Adrian Collett. Present. Yep. Councillor Roger Huckstep. Present, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Peter Latham. Here. Thank you. Councillor Anna McNair-Scott. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Well done, Anna. <laughs> Councillor <laughs> Kirsty North. Present, Chairman. Thank you, Kirsty. Councillor Russell Oppenheimer. I'm present, Chairman. I can see your face. Uh, Councillor Jackie Porter. No, that's unusual. Councillor Jackie Porter. Okay. Uh, Councillor Bruce Tennant. Present. Thank you. Councillor Michael Westbrook. Present. Morning, Michael. And Councillor Bill Withers. Present, Chairman. Who I've been speaking to. Okay. Uh, now we have apologies have been received from Councillor Frank Carpenter, and um, uh, Councillor Chris Carter has agreed to attend as the Conservative substitute. Um, confirmed, who, I'm Chris Chairman. I'm sorry. I say I'm confirming that I'm present, Chairman. At the oh, yeah. Good point. Thank you very much. Um, uh, are there any other apologies that I don't know of? Okay. Jackie Porter has just arrived, Councillor Glenn. Right, thank you for that. Good morning, Jackie. Good morning, my apologies. I've been struggling since 20 to 10 to get onto this. Sorry. Don't worry, Jackie, with this whole changeover in the, uh, let's say, updating no. our, our um, hybrid has so actually nine for all of us actually yeah um, well and the ipad as well so i'm really stuck so uh, yeah. i'm i'm here now though and concentrating yeah. and i have read the papers so <laughs> no but i've explained to the it that we need our ipads so that we can look at the minutes of previous meetings and such like whilst we've got people on screen on our hybrids and i've told them not to take them away um so they've given me I, i'm able to use my ipad with my um mod.gov and things, so I hope you are too. Um, right. If I could go on to apologies for absence. I've done that, okay. Uh, declarations of interest. If any of you have any declarations of interest, would you let us know now or at the item, please? Okay. Um, Deputations. Sorry, I uh, think Jackie Porter has has. I've oh, actually sorry, got Jackie. one. Yes, I have a good declaration because I'm chair of the Winchester Community Safety Partnership. Very good. Thank you. I'm sure that allows you to take part in a in a full complement of the meeting. Um, I don't think we've got any deputations, have we, Louise? We haven't, Chairman. Right. Okay. And we have started the webcast, have we? We have. Okay. And just to right. say that the the, um, the two representatives from the LEPS have now joined the meeting. All oh, right, excellent. I'd like to uh, I'd like to welcome our LEP representatives, um, the two executive officers. Uh, we have Kathy Slack and 
Anne Marie, is that right? Yes, Chairman. Very good. And Anne Marie Mudfield, that's right, from the Salt LEP. Right, we have <clears throat> we have um, an interesting uh, uh, set of items. We've got the LEP presentations, um, we've got the economic recovery, and we've got the community safety group. The community safety one is is a is a subject that we look at at this time every year. Um, I, I will inv <coughs> I will introduce Kathy Slack and Amory in a minute, but can I just say that each one of these meetings, each one of these items, are carefully selected in terms of time timing. Um, so the LEP presentation will run from 10.15 to 11 o'clock. Um, <clears throat> hopefully there'll be time for questions. Um, if there is time for questions, because of the narrowness of time, if you do have a question or something you want to add, we'll do it one by one to try and give as many members a chance to to get involved. OK, but if if we run out of time, <clears throat> we've agreed that uh, you could send your questions into Louise um, and Louise can pass them on to either Kathy and Anne Marie. Very grateful to them. Um, and they'll reply through Louise to all of us on the committee. Um, we've got David Fletcher coming in at 11 o'clock to 11.45. Um, of course, questions will be no problem with one of our own officers. And then we will not be starting the community safety strategy group until 12. So we might have a hiatus um, between the last two. Um, and uh, uh, so we might have a break. So we'll see how it goes. Um, that's it for announcements. I'd could like we, to sorry, welcome. Chairman, could, sorry, Chairman, could we just go back to item three for the minutes and see whether the members wish to agree them? Thank you. I do beg your pardon. Uh, right, minutes of the previous meeting. OK. Yeah. Uh, that's item three. Uh, let's go through page by page for accuracy. Page three on your odd.gov. Page four. And page five. Any points arising from those minutes? Can I take it as read with a show of hands? Because are agreed to everybody that they are agreed with the minutes. Confirmed. Anybody against? Anybody not happy with the minutes? Thank you. I'll um, take that as the minutes agreed. Thank you very much. Right, Louise, can I go on now? <laughs> you can. Sorry, Chairman. That's all right. Uh, right. Um, let us welcome Kathy Slack, who is the um, executive officer for Enterprise M3 LEP and Anne-Marie Mountfield, the Executive Officer for the Solent LEP. Um, first of all, good morning, ladies. Are you there? Good morning. Yes, very pleased to be here. That's Cathy here. Cathy, well done. And good morning, Chair. Yeah, I'm here too and uh, delighted to be here. Thank you. Right. Look, thank you both very much for coming. We're very grateful to you. Um, we we looked at the LEP issue, what really what the LEP was doing several months ago at a previous uh, Policy and Resources Select Committee, and uh, we were reminded by a, a, a committee member that it'd be nice to uh, find out what has been going on for the last year. And I had the privilege of being at the last Hyola meeting, where Kathy did a presentation on bringing it, bringing us up to date, and I was so interested in what she had to say. Um, I basically just asked her at the meeting in front of everybody, would you please come to our policy resources and bring that um, report with you? So I'm very grateful to you both. It's coming at pretty short notice to do this. So um, I will pass it on to Cathy and Anne-Marie to decide who's going to start. Yes, um, it, uh, I'm going to start, um, uh, Chairman and Group, and as I say, we're really pleased to be here. We are going to do this as a, a double act, and in particular, what we thought you would find helpful is, rather than keep jumping from Enterprise M3 to Solent, to cover relevant bits for each other. And I think that reflects the very close working that's going on 
between particularly uh, Anne-Marie and myself and my our teams, but also the work that we're doing across the South as part of an alliance of LEPs that are working together under the heading of Catalyst South. Um, so so that, that's where we're coming from. Um, we've sent you over a number of documents. Um, I think they're important documents because they show the sorts of key things that we're currently doing. So you will have seen a copy of our annual report. Uh, both LEPs are limited companies and have to produce a, an annual report and have a, an AGM. You will also have seen, importantly, our recovery plans, which we've been working very closely with the local authorities with, and actually, particularly with David as part of the um, LRF work um, for recovery. Um, and we'll touch a bit on that. And we've also sent you across a copy of our delivery plan, which has to be published on our website, which sets out what we're doing. And I think if you look at all of those three documents, you will just see how much activity has been taking place, particularly um, since March of this year when we've been going into lockdown and the work we've been doing on with businesses. Um, this session, uh, we thought we would focus particularly on projects because that's what you've asked us to do. Um, uh, we will say a little bit about our recovery plans because it is the recovery plans and the strategic economic work that is deciding more and more about where we place our priorities uh, and act. Um, so just a quick reminder in terms of, uh, of the, the, the LEPS key role, key role, two elements really, a very key role in terms of setting out a strategic economic plan, which we do through our local industrial strategies and recently our recovery documents. Um, the work then we particularly do on facilitating and convening, and we have done a huge amount in that area. Um, Anne-Marie in particular around the maritime sector and the cruise sector and all the issues, and I've been working very closely, particularly with Heathrow, um, and a lot of that work is not necessarily evident because it doesn't come through in our projects. And then, of course, there is the uh, amount of money that we've been putting through projects, again, very much often working with yourselves. Um, there's, there's, just, just so as you know, we, we, we will send you the slides around, by the way. Um, we've deliberately produced the slides in a similar way. So although this is Enterprise M3's one, there's also a very similar one for Solent. But I'm just going to use this one as a way of talking about both of those. Um, and I want to start with the, 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 the boxes around the amount of money that is going out each year. So if you'll see in the left-hand side um, that uh, last year we invested 97% um, of our total funding since we've had the, since the beginning, um, which is over 170 million since 2014. And in Solent, um, they have invested 99% of their funding, which is 157 million since 2014. So what you have got here, you have got two highly performing LEPs, and we know that from the uh, assessments we get from government and the focus we put on uh, expenditure and getting that money out the door to support projects that will support business. Um, I think the other thing um, to draw your attention to from this slide um, is there are several elements on here where we all where we work on similar ways. So we do a lot of work on the growth hub, and I'll touch on that later. We've been doing a huge amount on EU exit, working working together, and even more so uh, now coming up. We have both got enterprise zones that we work on. But particularly the themes of skills and clean growth and transport, we work together. But local enterprise partnerships reflect local areas. So the things that change is the sectors we focus on. Um, and in particular, we focus on games and space. You know, the a huge amount of uh, Solent is focused on that big range of the maritime sector, whether it's the cruise, the naval base, or um, the building of, of yachts and et cetera. The other thing I wanted to say is when you look towards um, the targets, particularly, and I'll, I'll turn to Anne-Marie's for that, because um, particularly in terms of houses, uh, learning space, and new jobs, these are all things that are determined by government. You again will see 
that in terms of the targets, we are exceeding um, those targets and again are delivering well. So that's just a quick uh, glance. Um, each of us now are just going to pull out a few key things of areas that we're focused on and we've deliberately focused uh, highlighting different types of areas to give you an idea of the range of what we're doing. And on this slide, um, we have an, an area which is, of course, different from um, the south in that we have got uh, very largely um, towns. We've got the city of Winchester, but it's a small city, so it's very much in towns. And these are very much the lifeblood of the area. And you will see that we've particularly focused on some of those areas that we feel have got great potential, um, investing in Whiteham and Borden, um, also investing uh, more and more in Andover, and I will unfortunately have to leave quite promptly today because I've got a meeting with the Andover political and executive team to hear about their plans for Andover at 11, um, but also investing in Aldershot um, and working with you um, on COVID-19 uh, responses to the Supporting Town Centre Fund. The other area we focused on, particularly on skills, is getting our FE colleges working together. Um, uh, it was really pleasing um, during uh, the first lockdown that one of the things the principals of the FE colleges fed back to us is that our investment with them in their technology and their, and their technology platforms had meant they could quickly move uh, to online learning for their students with minimum disruption. And we can continue to invest with them going forward. We've also done some investments in um, uh, Farm College of Technology, particularly emerging technologies around drones. <coughs> and esports and gaming technology is very strong within our area. Um, and we're doing some work within Alton College. A particular focus for all of us, and I think it's particularly challenging because it's very difficult to read how this will go and how this will play out, is the whole area of transport and smart, mobil smart, smart mobility. We have always invested heavily in sustainable transport, and I know that's very true of, of Solent as well. Um, this last year, we've done a lot of work on electric vehicle um, charging. Um, we've got a, a, a big scheme uh, going on in Winchester around charging. And we've been particularly vocal when talking to Transport for the South East about making sure there is a strong focus on their mobility strategy. And then the last area I particularly wanted to highlight was one of clean growth. Um, we have been working closely, particularly with Hampshire, since the 2015 plans and, and the work there around low carbon. We've been doing far more within this space. Um, we've recently la launched a green programme for decarbonisation uh, of, of, of buildings, a relatively small amount, but we hope that should we get further money from government, we will be able to do more within those areas. Um, in the interest of time, so I'm going to move on um, and pass over to Anne-Marie, who can talk about the solar projects. Thank you, Cathy, and um, good morning to everybody. Conscious of uh, time and the importance of, of leaving time for questions. Uh, uh, just leading on from what uh, Cathy has said, and I'm hoping Cathy will flip the slides on as I, I crack on through. Thank you, Cathy. Um, we um, a very brief summary here, and and uh, much of this information is is um, in more detail in the uh, annual report and our delivery plan that Cathy alluded to earlier. So just to give you a bit of a snapshot for um, the year that's completed 2019-20, uh, um, in that year. Part of our focus has been on small businesses. Um, we funded over 300 businesses. We've just given you. A a brief graphic there to show that it is across the uh, geography. Um, SME growth and survival in the Solent is a particular challenge, and this is where building on what Cathy says, there are some local challenges that we have in our respective LEPs um, that, that we use our investment funds to, to address, and for us one of them is SME uh, growth and survival. So we, we've got a range of programmes that look at that. And then the map below just gives you again a geographical kind of graphic of the spread of the investment. So um, in the past year, there's a, there's a very significant investment on the Fairham and Gosport Peninsula. You'll see a sort of purple blob there. 
um, which is around uh, road and uh, access infrastructure. There is another significant investment uh, along the water side, another peninsula uh, in the new forest there uh, around the A326. Um, I'm uh, keen to sort of highlight those because Hampshire County Council have been really uh, important uh, cornerstone partners in both those investments as, as the scheme leads that are taking those forward. And I know the work there will unlock uh, some significant growth opportunities in both those communities, uh, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit about. So that, that's an overview. If, if I ping to the next slide and return to the issue of uh, our small businesses, th this is just a couple of case studies to give you a sense of the breadth. So at one end of the um, scale, We've got companies like Innovate, Design and Build who are looking at growth. They're sort of precision manufacturing. Um, they've done things such as make the uh, Man of the Match trophies for the Football World Cups in the last two World Cups. So, you know, they, they do have a global reach. Um, they were keen to scale up, accelerate. So we gave them uh, a grant of £18,000 to improve their precision manufacturing. Uh, facilities and we we hope to carry on making trophies for global events as well as precision parts for um, uh, sort of business and activity in the Solent itself and then at the other end of the scale we're, we're very proud of our rural businesses uh, we've got a really strong rural community on the Isle of Wight and of course uh, in the New Forest this is just a, an example um, of the work we're doing with our partners, Natural Enterprise on the Isle of Wight. They run a rural network. We've been working with them for sort of four or five years now and have put in three quarters of a million pound to support our rural businesses um, to diversify. So alongside their rural activity, um, many of them have diversified into uh, a range of activities, including uh, visitor experiences, uh, retail um, options for the produce they grow locally um, and just spreading their their sort of if you like uh, market uh, position um, so we've uh, we've been working uh, as I say over three or four years um, it has supported 200 jobs in the rural economy and actually nearly 50 businesses and for the £750,000 we've put in, it's unlocked a further £750,000 from the businesses themselves. And it's certainly paid dividends during this um, COVID period because many of them have also started to look at digital formats for um, selling their produce. And the buy local, support your local businesses at this time is, is really uh, something that has been embraced. So, so that's just a couple of examples of small projects. If I move... Uh, forward a slide. A couple of things on skills um, completely uh, echo what Cathy said. In this scenario, we do work together very closely on them. Further education is dear to both our hearts, and um, uh, we're putting in corresponding uh, investment into our FE network. So you've got an example here of the uh, brand new uh, Centre for Civil Engineering, CTEC, which is on the Solent Enterprise Zone. This is a civil engineering uh, specialist facility to meet the requirements of the construction industry who are constantly challenged in terms of accessing skilled labour for groundworks and some of those very sort of key foundation works um, that do go on as major infrastructure uh, projects um, get off the ground. And we're really keen that our residents um, can benefit from the investments we make. So having a training facility that allows local residents to train up and take advantage of the opportunities, for example, in the civil engineering industry, is really important to us. And, and that's something that we've done in partnership with Fairham College and the construction industry. Um, the other side is the work we do at schools, um, and certainly uh, uh, Cathy alluded to the maritime work we do. Um, we're, we're really keen again to engage young people at a very early age with industry, and we were able to bring our young people from one of the Hampshire schools to London International Shipping Week, and you can see the picture there, they met the Prime Minister, they met the Secretary of State for Defence, they went on board the vessels and, you know, came back to their school um, with, you know, lots of sort of food for thought, really, about the sort of careers in maritime that they may be able to access. And they were real 
brilliant young ambassadors for the region. They were fantastic up there. And, and I think it was a great day for the region because they did showcase um, the talent, particularly that we have in the Hampshire schools. Um, so, so that was really positive. Um, and then if I move on to some of the bigger projects, um, connecting our community is a really uh, important aspect. And this is where our geography is slightly different to the Enterprise M3 geography. Having a coast, we, we do have some quite natural sort of challenges around connecting islands and peninsulas, um, as well as improving the infrastructure to um, reflect the, um, the, the sort of nature of the industry in the area. So a couple of examples here, you'll see a picture of our Enterprise zone there, which sort of sits right on the coast. It's uh, the former Daedalus airfield. Um, obviously, a lot of investment has gone into the airfield itself in previous years. We, we've invested nearly £40 million there ourselves. I know Fair and Borough Council have made significant investment uh, as well. Um, and um, one of the things we focus on this year is access to that key site. So in partnership with Hampshire, we've invested £35 million to enable the Stubbington Bypass to come forward. That will sort of uh, open up access from that key employment site right through to the sort of M27 uh, motorway um, and just generate a more sort of uh, attractive offer for businesses in terms of the location of the site, but also its access to other other parts of the region. Um, that construction is um, underway. It's, it's it's a significant progress, um, despite the sort of position around the uh, global pandemic. Um, and the other snapshot you'll see there is another one of our developments, North Whiteley. That's a uh, three and a half thousand houses going in uh, around uh, the southern end of Winchester. And this is a really good example of where we work together, um, Enterprise M3 and Solent. So this is in the Enterprise M3 area. But working with Cathy and Winchester City Council, we acknowledge that um, many people that work in the solar probably live in the Enterprise M3 area and vice versa. So we are very much working in partnership to invest across borders as well as part of our cross working. Um, and this is one such example uh, where that's taken place. So that's a, um, a very brief canter through the investments to date in the past year in the projects. But we also thought it would be good to talk a little bit about um, some new activity that um, started to develop in June this year, summer this year in response to the uh, global pandemic. The government announced a new getting building fund, um, which was designed to provide some economic stimulus to areas. Um, I think the work that the LEPs have done to turn this fund around very quickly and get the money out the door and, and supporting projects has been um, key to sort of driving that stimulus. And both uh, Cathy and myself with uh, EM3 and, and Solar, we, we've um, been looking at working with businesses post the global pandemic to see what sort of growth opportunities um, are coming forward. And in very simple terms there, I just want to give you a snapshot of the sort of things we're looking at. So Cathy talked earlier about clean growth growth and green growth that has featured in some of the investments we've made with this money. So you'll see um, some work there, for example, we're doing with the University of Portsmouth around um, enzyme innovation to help with recycling. And I know when we ping to the uh, EM3 slide, we can probably do that now, Cathy. Um, uh, there's a big emphasis on things like park and ride and uh, electric vehicle charging. There's a clean growth programme. All of this is about unlocking um, new sort of uh, opportunities for growth in recovery. And we do know that the government are putting significant um, emphasis on green growth and providing investment to support companies and to support local areas adopting new approaches to clean growth as they work towards targets around zero emissions. But there's also some projects in there that reflect um, the importance of the rural agenda. So you can see a gigabit uh, town and rural program there on the EM3 uh, uh, program of activity. And similarly, we're investing in some rural um, employment opportunities um, on the Isle of Wight in a rural hub. So common themes are across the two. Um, and we've reflected the very difficult um, circumstances for our visitor economy and our cruise industry. So um, unsurprisingly, 
a big investment for us in the Solent um, for a brand new cruise terminal uh, at the Port of Southampton so that, you know, we are ready uh, for when industries like the cruise industry return and that we have these sort of um, statements of confidence in that industry so that um, as things do improve and we do see cruise ships calling again, we have got world leading uh, facilities. So so that's a little bit about the projects that have delivered, the programme uh, that is to come. And um, just before I hand back to Cathy, the, the final area I wanted to look at was digital technology. I think we're all working digitally today. Um, I think many of us are coming to terms um, at different rates with digital platforms. So I think we all recognise the importance of that. And I think that does drive some of the emphasis of the investments that are being made across Hampshire through the two getting building funds in digital architecture as well, um, because this clearly will be an important element of infrastructure as, as we move forward. So um, I think I'll hand back to you, Cathy, to talk a bit about business support um, and I'm happy to take questions at the end. Okay, and, and carrying on that um, theme of working closely together, um, one of the things the government put in place last last year was a, a series of what they call clusters. Um, so groups of LEPs working their growth hubs together. Um, and uh, I lead the group uh, South Central, which comprises Enterprise M3, um, Solent, Close to Capital and Thames Valley Berkshire. This has been exceptionally successful, not least because of that sharing of good practice and working together. And we have done a number of things together over this last year. And the interesting thing that has particularly happened this last year is the level of funds that are starting to flow through the growth hubs um, in terms of going and, and taking money out of businesses. So there's a lot of things that come forward, and I've just sort of tried to capture some of those figures. So on the left-hand side, um, in terms of the growth hubs, every um, LEP has a growth hub, which is a, a facility to support businesses, um, particularly um, uh, sm smaller businesses, if you, if you like. Um, uh, our growth hub is outsourced, uh, but we're bringing in this uh, next in, in March, and uh, Solent has already got their growth hub in in house. Um, an additional 660k has been put into those two growth hubs to help them reach out to business. Um, we are still running uh, European programs, and one of the things that came in this last year as a as, the, as a response to COVID was that the um, ERDF uh, development fund money were pulled into a national programme and was put out to support particularly um, the tourism uh, uh, businesses. So that was 300k in total, came out to our growth hubs, and then a further 500k to as a restart and recovery grant. Those two schemes have been so popular. Uh, it has been really, really, really difficult to manage just because of the sheer amount of demand that has come through. And we're now seeing if we can secure some additional money. Uh, we've also been given um, 170K for a peer-to-peer -peer program, which is getting groups of businesses together to learn from each other, but also to uh, have a facilitator alongside them. Um, that is a longer term program and that is all just uh, kicking off. And then we're just waiting to hear what additional funds we're likely to get for UK transition, which is to pick up from the tele tele television campaign that's been running and the campaign within the media about encouraging um, uh, businesses uh, to get ready for UK transition. Um, so that's it. That's a lot of the work that we've been doing in terms of projects and direct delivery. Um, but one of the critical things, and this is going to lead in neatly um, to David's session uh, later about recovery plans, is the work that we've been doing in looking at our recovery plans going forward. But I'll hand back to Anne Marie, who's going to cover this last bit. Thank you, Cathy. And um, uh, it, it seems. Um timely in in many ways to be talking about recovery again um the work that we've been doing individually and collectively on economic recovery um started um during the first lockdown 
uh, it was clear that um, there were a number of challenges for individuals and businesses as a result of that. Um, some of them very real cash flow challenges, as obviously, you know, not being able to trade had a, an impact on their business. But also um, some of them in terms of plans for growth. Um, and um, we produced a, an economic recovery plan to shape our response to the pandemic it, during that first lockdown and published it uh, a month ago. And, and I'll talk a bit about the uh, Enterprise M3 recovery plan as well, because that's followed a, a very similar approach. But just to give you a flavour of, of how that works, um, if Cathy pings to the next slide, um, at the time of publishing this, we we really were looking at three kind of recurring themes that were coming through from business. The first was about survival. How do we survive and work through this pandemic so that when things do change, we, we can return to some form of uh, trading levels that they'd previously experienced, which is what we see as the response phase. Then there was a kind of uh, sense of, and how do we then restart and get back to restoring those um, uh, previous levels of activity that we've lost, which is this restart uh, and restore phase, which is about sort of strengthening business resilience. Um, and, and we still have ambitions, uh, all of us collectively, as well as in individual areas, about long term growth and, you know, that point at which we can recover and there are appropriate solutions for uh, containing the virus. So it is important to keep that, that vision uh, in our minds. Um, I think when we published our plan, I think there was a hope that there wouldn't be another lockdown. So very much we've been working in the response phase, providing the business support um, solutions that Cathy has just described uh, really well uh, across the two LEPs. Um, and they have taken the form of uh things like the peer-to-peer -peer network funding opportunities for businesses to be uh, bid to um and also mentoring um uh activity um we have been starting to look at restart funding support as well and and kathy mentioned the erdf fund which you'll you'll see on the the table there to support the visitor economy and wider economy restart um in the Solon area, we've also offered loan funding and we had a strong take up from particularly our bigger visitor economy assets who were keen to secure loans to, to sort of keep their uh, visitor attractions open and, and build back business uh, through the winter. Now, clearly, obviously, that's in a different place with the most recent announcements. Um, and you'll see on there the getting building sort of economic stimulus funding. Um, so all of those things have been a really important part of our business support package. But it's really, really important as well to think about the individuals that have been impacted by this. So skills forms a very important part of that agenda as well. And we're doing a lot of work around um, Kickstart, which is a government programme uh, as part of their plan for jobs to uh, support um, people returning to some form of short-term employment or medium-term employment where they have lost their jobs, as well as upskilling opportunities as people think about career changes or think about using this time to strengthen their skill set. Um, and in the Solent area, and I know in the EM3 area as well, we're working on the opportunity that's come down from government to look at establishing institutes of technology, which really do focus on professional career pathways at level four and above. So all of those things will be really important as part of our sort of improving the resilience of the economy, but also setting down a platform for growth uh, moving forward. And if I just ping to the to the last slide, Cathy, um, very, very similar sort of flavour um, in terms of the renewal action plan that, um, that has been developed in the enterprise M3 area as well. So you'll see that focus on individuals with job creation and skills for employment, uh, big focus on town centre regeneration and housing supply. Uh, as well as support for businesses. And uh, 
the green growth agenda. And I think um, the, the final point on this slide is a really important one. Both LEPs have been really working very hard um, to ensure that their convening role is brought into, into play, bringing businesses together with our local authority partners, uh, looking at where we can share sort of agendas and, and ideas um, on projects. And I think that sort of convening and sharing and collaborating and working together is going to be a vital component to all of the work we do collectively as we work together to, to overcome this sort of economic uh, challenge that we're all facing as a result of the pandemic. And I think both of the LEPs are going to be reviewing the recovery plans in light of the recent announcements to see can we continue to repurpose our funds and our activities to continue to help businesses and individuals. So even though they've only been recently published, um, as I'm sure you appreciate, they're very much live documents that will need constant review and updating as we live in, in very dynamic times. Um, so I think... Um, I think it's probably a good place to close because I think both Kathy and I would really welcome any questions or reflections you have um, as we uh, as we move forward um, with our recovery plan and as we reflect back on the investments we've made to date. So thank you very much. Um, Anne-Marie and Kathy, thank you so much for a very interesting presentation. Um, I imagine I'll start seeing hands going up for people who'd like to ask questions or uh, or certainly initiate some debate. Um, very good. We'll, we'll, you've got 15 minutes. I presume we'll let you go at, at uh, 11 o'clock. And before we start, can I now welcome um, three of our cabinet members? Uh, we've got Councillor Keith Manns, uh, the uh, leader of the County Council. We've got um, Councillor Stephen Reid, the executive member for commercial strategy, human resources and performance. And Councillor Judith Goyevsky, Executive Member for Public Health. I think it's important that uh, Kathy and Amory, you, you know that they're here as well. Mm -hmm. And so we'll, um, uh, let me start this. I see two hands up. Let me start this. Could you please tell me how, let's say, um, lay members of the public or even mere county councillors or any type of councillor is able to make contact with any of the LEPs if they come up with what they think is a good idea, which you ought to let's say, start working up? Um, I mean, I, I, if I start off with that, we, we've obviously all both got websites um, and it's that on each of those, there are clear contact points, particularly around particular themes. Um, so there's the ways of people who can contact us and there's a, a, a general information point on ours. Um, we also have to set out quite clearly the process for taking forward projects and being transparent. And that, again, is set out on each of our websites about how people can come forward. Um, what we tend to do is do a lot of reaching out to organisations. Um, it's, of course, less easy um, to work directly with members of the public, but that's why we're often working alongside local authorities, community bodies and the like to get as many views as possible on what's going on. But Anne-Marie, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, thank you, Cathy. Um, I completely um, in, in, endorse and reinforce everything Cathy said in terms of um, the uh, infrastructure that's there. Um, in addition to that, it is important that we have consultation and an opportunity for people to have their say on activity, both in at a strategic level and an individual level. So, um, for example, the economic recovery plan um, was heavily consulted on both at sort of local authority level and with businesses and with individuals. And that's a good way to enhance the engagement over and above the kind of um, framework under the assurance framework. Secondly, all our investments go out to consultation, so they're all publicly consulted on because it is really important that people have the opportunity to um, reflect or input to investments as part of the decision-making framework. Um, in fact, we've got some consultations out now for, for colleagues that are online on our Getting Building Fund. So, you know, there's a real opportunity there for people to reflect on the proposed investments and share their views on how they think it will provide the economic stimulus or indeed whether they think um, further thinking on economic 
stimulus needs to be undertaken. Um, and we also have a Solent Growth Forum, which um, has representatives from each local authority on it. It does meet in public, um, so it's also open to the public, where people again can can influence, shape and input to the work that the LEP is doing, whether it's the, the sort of funded investments, the development of strategy or on individual projects. Um, but we can always do more, I'm sure. And, and I think I completely agree with Cathy. You know, we're, we're using the experience we're gaining with virtual platforms to see, well, going forward, when things are a little bit uh, more stable, can we also utilise technology to broaden the engagement and the consultation that, um, that local enterprise partnerships have with stakeholder groups, including elected members, members of the public, um, as well as businesses. So, so I think it's a journey for us, uh, Chair. I think we're we're you know always open to wider engagement, and, and that's why actually being invited to this meeting is really important for Cathy and I. It's, it's a really important part of that uh, working in partnership. So we we are genuinely very grateful for the opportunity to share work that we are doing, and we're really keen to hear feedback. Um, so thank right. you. Thank you very much for that. Right, let's start with the hands. Uh, the first one that we'll start with at the top is Councillor Jackie Porter. Hello, Jackie. Uh, Councillor Porter, are you there? Do you need to unmute yourself, Councillor Porter? Right, whilst we're waiting, let's go on to Mike Westbrook. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Cathy and Aunt Marie for the presentation. Um, I wanted to ask a question, really. I asked this, asked this question last year um, and it referred to, um, it was about timescales really for delivery of and funding windows. And uh, I wondered if there was any flexibility on projects because the, the thing I've noticed, we, for example, the example I used last year was the Thornycroft roundabout in Basingstoke adjacent to the leisure park. And we have these tight windows for funding from let money and, and the likes where we have to deliver projects and, and obviously the leisure park hasn't come forward um, as yet but you know they're right close to each other and, and the question i was asking was um do we have any do you have or do we have any flexibility to delay those major projects because obviously if you have an impact from another project like the leisure park onto a roundabout we don't want to go backwards and try and um, have problems like that. And that could be relevant to anything with new housing developments turning up and things. And sometimes when you know things are in the pipeline or about to happen, um, it would be really, really beneficial sometimes to be able to have a delay on that without losing the funding, you know, and obviously sometimes things get rushed. Um, and that was my question, which, which is what I asked last year. And I wonder if there's any progress being made on that really. Shall I answer? And I am totally with you. I, I wish we could have more flexibility, but if anything, the, the situation is now worse. And 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 uh, what 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 we are in, we're in the very last year of our local growth fund. Uh, so effectively, that the, there will be no more funds called local growth funds. So we run a local growth fund, and as Anne Marie talked, we've also run a getting building fund, which also. Um, although that's got a slightly longer time scale, is only until March 22. Um, so we have to spend our money by that date, and we are being pushed really hard by by a government. We're measured on that uh, as one of the things that are measures, and, uh, and and we get rated on that uh, in terms of expenditure. But it is particularly difficult when you're in the last year. Because, and particularly in the last year when you go through something like COVID, which understandably has created problems in delay, whether that's in construction or in capacity, I think that's the other issue. We're doing what we can. We're trying to be as flexible as we can. Um, but we now face quite a tricky issue in that effectively... Um, if money does come back in, it is very difficult to get some big projects underway and out by March. Um, we're having some um, creative 
discussions um, with our accountable body, which is Hampshire, about what we might be, might do, trying to be flexible. We totally understand where, where you're coming from. I think, importantly, we work really, really closely with your officers because we understand what the issues are and we want to do things that make sense um, so that we can uh, take forward the economy. Uh, but it, it is difficult times. And just to add to, to, to what Cathy was saying, I completely agree as well. It would be lovely to have more flexibility. And this is an area where we, we're really keen to work with local leaders, because I think if we have a collective voice on this to seek further flexibility, it would, it would certainly change what we could all do together. Um, and I think, um, you know, we, we know that um, before the end of the month, there will be the spending review, but sadly, it's not going to be a three year review. It's going to be a one year announcement from the Chancellor. So everything Cathy has just described will will be there in 20 fold, you know, it will be another very intense period. So I think the other thing we're trying to do is is preempt that things are going to continue to be um, tight uh, with ridiculously short turnaround times and work with our partners, including local authorities, to, to sort of almost say, well, imagine if we did receive further funding, what would we do together so that ahead of receiving funding, we're having some early conversations. But I, I agree with Cathy, even with those early conversations, turning things around in the time that we're now working to these very hard deadlines of end of March 21, end of March 22 is is phenomenally challenging. Um, so um, we'd love more flexibility, I think, wouldn't we, Cathy? Thank you, ladies. Um, can I, I'm not going to kick. Can I just back. say? Can well, I just? Mike, come back on we've got we've got Mike. Um, it's going to be very quick, Mike, because I want to let yeah, uh, yeah, Roger just very in. quickly. I mean, it's pretty, it's really good that, that Kathy and Anne Maria uh, see the common sense of that and agree with that. I think, I think it's got to be more, and obviously working with officers, but I think it's important that the government um, uses a common sense approach sometimes in funding, um, because I think that's going to be necessary. I've been working in construction partly my part of my life. I know, how, you know, you can't future proof everything, but you know, sometimes common sense does come into play. Thanks. All right, thank you, Mike. Right, Roger. Roger, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it could be that uh, Cathy has partially answered my question. I wondered, have you got metrics and measures which show how you get a return on investment from the funding you put in to small businesses and enterprises? Because in theory, hopefully, uh, those enterprises are profitable. They then um, they then end up paying taxes to HMLC. So. What do you have a figure for the return of investment on your funding versus tax revenue? I've not got a figure as such. Um, we we have got figures on some of our projects. I have not got it to hand, but I can get it to you for our we run an expansion and equity fund. So we've got 10 million in that. Um, that's a loan fund. So we know on that how much money is coming back in. And I think it's something like four times the amount that we, we put in. We also have to do work um, on our infrastructure programs and look at uh, return on investment. And the other thing we do is, um, and we're currently that we, we did two years ago, an evaluation across our whole program. And we look and evaluate some of our key projects. And that's the important thing. It's, some of these things are quite difficult to evaluate because it's actually not just, if you like, the let money going in. It's a number of different factors. Um, but certainly we've we've got some figures. I've not exactly got the, the, the figures to hand, but I can provide you with some. And I don't know if Anne-Marie has, has got anything that you use. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really important question and value for money for the taxpayer has to be a core consideration and in investments that we make. So you may have seen on the early slide that for 1920, you know, the investment profile we had of uh, 62 million is expected to to unlock a further 150 million. And the question is, well, how on earth have you calculated that? And, and that's where the business cases are really important. So anybody submitting a business case for investment for the large scale projects are required to bring forward what we would describe as an economic case, which sets out you know if we invest in you how much investment will you unlock 
And, and I think there are three levels to that. There's a very simple recognition that, you know, a project will cost X, we will put Y into it, and therefore you can calculate the cash um, or the financial investment that the um, the partner is is going to make. Um, so that, hence, we can give you some, some uh, very early figures on that, and you'll see it in the annual reports. But I think the investment that's more... Um, complex is what we would call the uh, gross value added or the economic investment that's generated as a result of jobs creation, those jobs being um, taken by local people who then spend money in the economy. And you will see that in the business cases for the investments um, that we make, that they, they make a calculation on how much added value or uh, added benefit will come over and above the investment that the funding beneficiary makes and the LEP makes. And Cathy's just given a really good example there of the equity fund. And we do evaluations post-project, as as Cathy's just described, to, to make sure that, you know, if someone says that there is going to be further economic value to be gained, that we evaluate that once the project has completed. So, um, so certainly for us last year, 60 million is going to un unlock 150 million additional investment. And, you know, in a year's time, when those projects have finished their construction stage, we will be back evaluating them to see and how much of that 150 million was realised. And it will be interesting to see and how has coronavirus impacted on the total return and the speed at which that return comes back. So, so they're all very important uh, considerations, I think, for for all local enterprise partnerships. Right, thank you. Thank you. That, that, that's very helpful. Uh, I think it shows the LEPs are in their own way profitable. That's good. Thank you, Roger. Now, uh, Councillor Porter. We don't have much time left, but thank you. I know. I I think in view of the time, I know Kathy's got to go off, so I'll I'll email Kathy and perhaps. No, no, no. On. You've got time. Just okay. ask a question. So, I think so we'd all like to know what you. We'd all okay. like to know what you're doing. <laughs> um, okay. So I'm, I congratulate you on the making every funding decision a clean growth decision. Mm -hmm. But obviously, one of the big parts of it, and even you have to, have. have uh, slowed down in, in the delivery on this my my screen today is about the gigabit m3 yeah. uh delivery how do you actually help to hope to unlock the rather cumbersome process that we currently have because uh, certainly businesses in urban areas and semi-urban areas as well as rural areas are still struggling with consistent up and download speeds we we are putting a major investment into uh, the development of a fibre spine. So we are doing some enabling work on that. Initially, that will run from Basingstoke to Guildford. We've already done some work um, working with Ordnance Survey at mapping best routes um, for that. Um, and we're working very closely um, with local authorities. In fact, Councillor Rob Humby uh, chairs the group looking at taking this forward. It is a very ambitious pro progress uh, project, um, but the significance of it is we we believe, and I know Anne Marie's in a similar situation, that actually it is that digital connectivity which will make sure that we retain our competitiveness and particularly allow communities to engage in a, a far more cost effective way. So I think it is really, really critical. And we're all working closely with the broad broadband providers to particularly get um, some of that broadband out to the, the more difficult areas. And, and I know in particular that Winchester is difficult because and ever I'm on a call um, to various people, you, you are starting to realise who, who, where people have got problems. I live in South Oxfordshire, so constantly I'm getting something that's coming up which says network quality. But we're really pushing hard on that. We're working closely with DCMS on that. Um, and, and one of the things I think is we're going to it's going to be very, very difficult for the South to secure funding. But I think on the digital connectivity bit, I'm hopeful that we will be able to secure some funding. And I'm yeah, sorry, I'm but I'm going to go in a moment. But Jackie, I'll, I'll I, know, I just say very keen to make sure that upload speeds are really good as well as yes. downside speeds. Yes. I think we're seeing an example of it here. Okay. Yes. OK. So, are you trying to add anything? Thank Amber? you. No, completely yeah, endorse I'm... what Cathy says. Um, you know, we're in a similar position right. at the moment. We're prioritising connection into the new forest, hence 
one of our getting building fund investments is is exactly in the same space that Kathy described. And it would, you know, I'd love us to have more money because there are so many candidates that want we, to improve we connection. Um, so again, a real area we'd love to work with you all on to lobby hard to get, you know, further funds so that we can strengthen connectivity. So whether you're in Winchester or the New Forest or, you know, where I am in, in Gosport, we've all got the same upload and download speeds. So uh, and, definite and, shared agenda there. Marie, when, when, um, when we're back in touch with government for more money, we'll put in a good word for you, OK? Thank you very much. We'd really appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, look, ladies, I'll let you go. Uh, thank you very much for the, the, the three of you who put in questions. Um, I also like to thank everybody for not putting their hands up. <laughs> right. And uh, ladies, uh, we'll, if it's all right with you, we'll have you back in about a year's time or whenever yeah. we see, think it's, it's useful. We'd obviously like to know how you're going to be dealing with stuff once we get back to some sort of economic normality. And we all hope that's going to happen sooner rather than later. But thank you both very, very much for coming. Um, and I'm sure I speak for the whole of the, uh, the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe, everybody. Bye-bye. Sure enough. Thank you. And with that in mind, um, do I assume we can do it by a show of hands that we all have noted with relish the, uh, the um, presentation by the LEP uh, and the, re the requirement to have them back again when it suits. Just a show of hands will do, or some of you just shout agreed. OK, I'll take that as a yes. Thank you very much indeed. And moving on to David Fletcher. David, are you there? Please do that. Uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> right. Yes, you can see me. That's good. Just hold on. Uh, what, what I did want to just ask, Chair, was I know, I know we're quite specific on timings today. So if you if you give me um, um, a kind of finish line and, and including discussion, I'll aim to uh, keep us on track, if that makes sense. Right. OK, now, David, are you are you hidebound by time? Do you have to leave by 11.45? I don't have to leave by then. That was just the slot that I think we agreed. That's all. So there's some flexibility there. But I'm guessing people might want a comfort break before the 12 o'clock slot. So um, I wasn't planning to give them any break. <laughs> 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 I know it's well, a cruel system we are, we run here. Right, uh, David, you just get started. You take whatever time you need, and then we'll let in the questions. And um, if we have lots of time, we will certainly have a break. So David, no, over to you. Economic yeah, that's recovery. Fun. There are, um, before I just get into the slides, because I'm conscious when I when I share those, that sort of takes up the most of the screen. Um, what, I, what I wanted to just quickly dwell on here, and there's quite a lot of ground to cover, is, is first of all, a, a little bit of a, a discussion around the what the data is telling us about what's happened to the Hampshire economy um, during the last, you know, six, seven, eight months. Um, th then something around... Um, uh, the, 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 obviously, the, the, the national lockdown and the implications there in the in the short term, and what the possible impact of that might be. Um, then I want to talk about um, some of the engagement we've had with very specific parts of the economy, looking in a sense beyond the current crisis, and maybe sometimes looking at some of the measures we might want to put in place, um, medium to long term, um, and how that's then feeding into the county council zone kind of economic recovery framework, again, not for the short term, but maybe for the sort of medium and long term. Um, and then finally, I was going to cover, if we have time, uh, just a very brief update on a specific initiative, which is very relevant to Hampshire and is very imminent, is, is, is uh, the Freeports competition that the government's initiating. So as you can hear, quite a bit to cover. What I was intending to do, but I'm happy, Chair, to be advised by you on how best to do this, is w whether I sort of take a breath at what feels like a natural sort of um, uh, sort of um, after a certain part of the presentation, and then if people want, because I'm conscious, if we cover all that ground in one go, um, one I'll probably um, get exhausted, but also people might have forgotten questions they wish to ask. So, shall, shall we should we try it like that? Is that worth a try? try? But bear in mind that the minute you give a, a group of councillors a chance to start asking questions, that will be the end of your presentation. I know, I know, but. Um, let, let's let's go for the um, not okay. the high strategy, right. but okay. yeah. let me let me just try and get these um, these slides up. I have, if I'm completely honest, I have um, slightly updated these um, slides um, 
because of partly because of obviously the the events over the last few days. Yeah. And I thought it was better to reflect that um, rather than just um, stick stoically with the the original slide deck. But um, okay, right, and 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 very useful as, as you said, Chair. That um, we, we've heard from the LEPs, who are obviously a critical part of the landscape of of supporting the economy. Um, I think that the, the, in a sense the the dilemma may be the LEPs and ourselves have at times is and, and central government has. Is, is to what extent do you focus on the here and now um, and throw your resources at that? And to what extent do you also look? And I like the phrase that I read in the report the other day, which was about looking beyond the crisis. And, and I think certainly we need to retain at a strategic level at least one eye on the, the longer term future and, and the, the ways in which we can ensure Hampshire remains a, a prosperous place into the future. Um, so first of all, as I promised, I was just going to touch on some of the the data some of you may have seen um, something which we we conceived and 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 started to produce on a monthly basis right at the beginning of the crisis which is a, an economic dashboard for the hampshire and isle of white area um if, if if any of the members of the committee have not seen that uh, we can certainly share a copy with you um it, it it basically shows some of this data i'm about to run through but in quite a a graphical way rather than it being a long a long narrative because a lot of people just want to see what the indicators are saying. One of the challenges, of course, is that government data is often has a big time delay. And what we try to do is put together a set of measures which give us a relatively live sense of what's happening in the economy. So first of all, in terms of um, GDP, the actual the, the, the scale of the economy, um, largely, as you can see, uh, the red is the national figures, the blue is Hampshire Isle of White. So, so largely sort of follows the national picture. And you can see the first two months of the six months that's shown here, we obviously saw those dramatic drops in, um, in, in, in GDP, um, both nationally and across Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. And then from May onwards, we started to see initially a very gentle recovery. And then, and then that started to accelerate in June, slightly decelerated in July. And decelerated slightly again in August, but still growing, but at a, at a, at a lower rate. And those are month on month percentages um, in terms of the changes. Now, of course, you know, the obvious question is what happens in September, or October? Uh, we haven't got the data for that yet. Um, and uh, I think the concern we probably have on a, on a national level, maybe less so on a Hampshire level, but is, of course, the, the local lockdowns that were kicking off. Will have, will have inevitably had some impact on the economy, but we don't know what to, to what degree yet. Uh, of course, that didn't apply to uh, to, to, to Hampshire, um, obviously, but the national lockdown clearly does. Um, oh, sorry, one thing I should say, the, the, the question that someone might ask is, where does that leave us relative to where we were in February? At the moment, we're probably at a sort of net impact of something like minus 9%. So if you if you uh, if you if you if you it's not the maths of adding those pluses and minuses, it's actually the cumulative effect of of um, the overall uh, downs and ups. We end up at the moment something like minus nine percent compared to where we were in February. Um, the labour market. This is not official statistics. This is um, another set of data we have uh, around job vacancies being advertised. And but you can see from a macro perspective compared to last year. We are something like 50% um, down on the kind of and declining, as you can see the the um, the graph, the red line is is obviously moving in a in a negative direction there. Um, but this is actually um, looking over a much longer time frame, including the the previous two um, economic downturns in the UK. Um, one of the key points um, here is is how the the labour market tends to lag in terms of its um, in terms of its uh, recovery. Um, so even if we see in the in in um, in Hampshire or in the UK um, that the GDP figures recover, um, it might be some time can be as much as two years before the labour market uh, will get back to the, the sort of um, where you started from, basically. Um, the key um, figure here on these on this graph is the 2.1% to 5.2% there, which is the um, the claimant count. Um, so that grew over the early months of uh, the pandemic from, so it, it obviously more than doubled, but it has sort of remained static for a couple of months. So 
We haven't seen that number rise any further, but I think we were all nervous that it would start to rise, particularly as the job retention scheme ceased. Of course, that's been put back by another month. Um, so whether that helps us in that situation, um, not certain, but um, obviously that longer term, there is a challenge, there is a risk that some of the sectors will will see some some unemployment that will sort of drift uh, into into next year. And then um, in terms of the, um, the, the the schemes that the government um, set out to support employment, uh, the, the job retention scheme or the furlough scheme and the self-employed income support scheme, uh, these are the figures for June uh, versus August. Um, June was the peak where between the two schemes we had, as you can see there, just over 352,000 residents across the Hampshire and the Isle of Wight that were dependent on those schemes or being supported by those schemes. The, the self-employed figures have, 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 have not changed drastically, um, but as you can see from June to August, the, the number of people on the furlough scheme has significantly dropped, and we're now at less than half of what we were at at the peak, which I, 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 I guess is, 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 um, is, is positive on one level. Um, what I don't have is the stats that show you what proportion of those people that came off the furlough scheme might have ultimately lost their jobs. We we don't we don't we can't we can't link it in that way. But uh, I think clearly that's one of the concerns is as the claimant crown increases and those numbers decrease. And I mean there's always bound to be some fallout possibly in that in that process. Um, and of course on the on the right hand side here you can see the different sectors of the economy which have uh, have, have utilised that scheme. No surprise there that you've got a big focus around. Uh, the kind of leisure, hospitality kind of sectors, um, and obviously the public sector much, much less so, um, and and some of those other sectors which have which have continued to um, largely, uh, you know, operate uh, not as usual, but but something like near normality. So um, a, a very different picture between different parts of the economy there. Um, and then this slide, I'm always a little bit nervous about putting this slide up because I. I tend to get more questions about where the data comes from than what it's actually saying. Um, what, what, what this is, is that the, the top two slides are about actual data um, through purchasing man the Purchasing Managers Index, which is, which is a, real, a real survey of real managers in business, um, showing what the act business activity is, whether that's new orders or what have you. And obviously what we did see there was we saw from, from April, May, we saw that sort of increase again in activity which sort of matches the GDP figures um, that we re we suspected was becoming more fragile as obviously the infection rates increased and in a sense confidence in the economy started to to, to potentially stall again and then the, 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 the two um, graphs at the bottom are more about sentiment one in business one in the consumer and it's interesting there where um, as again it's been a very bumpy ride in terms of it was it was it was sort of regaining confidence in business, uh, but then actually it's it's gone a little bit uh, erratic towards the end, which was probably what you'd predict. And similarly with consumer sentiment, it obviously dropped to a low, but then then started to to regain. But of course, again, that might be that might be rather fragile. Um, so in, in just in, in in terms of the national lockdown. Um, we all know that the um, the sectors that have been identified, which are the ones that have to not necessarily cease trading, but certainly um, change their operations. Some cl clearly do cease trading, but some of those parts, some parts of those sectors are able to continue trading, but in different ways. Um, we we've analysed quickly. Around about 211,000 jobs are in the the sectors affected um, across Hampshire and Isle of Wight. Um, the, not, not, not the whole of those sectors, but the parts of those sectors which we think are captured by the government guidance. And you're talking there something like 23% of all employment. Um, and uh, in case anybody asks, if you look at the Hampshire County Council area, it's around 146,000, but the, the percentage, the percentage is, is, um, is pretty much the same. Um, and this is just, a, I, I don't know how meaningful this is, um, economists do love maps and, and keys, So, but this is actually just showing how those exposed sectors, um, the, the percentage of total employment in each of those 
um, areas. So you can see there actually Fairham comes out quite well in terms of it's not as dependent on those sectors. And those areas like Hart, New Forest and Isle of Wight are uh, more heavily dependent on those sectors. So you could, uh, you could argue there is a, a higher risk in those areas. I, I would argue, yes, there is, but we're talking sometimes a few pe percentage points here and there. It's, you know, it's, it's probably not something that's um, hugely different across Hampshire, but certainly we do have um, a significant proportion of people in, you know, tourism, hospitality, etc., more so than other parts of the UK. So that is a, in a sense, of vulnerability. Um, and then in terms of the business support, some of the detailed guidance is actually still emerging. Local authorities are anticipating more details today about not only the nature of support, uh, but also when they'll receive the funding um, to deliver this. Um, and some of you may have seen this, that what the government has effectively done, it's a little bit of a rerun of what happened earlier in the year, in that um, there's going to be some elements of grants paid directly to businesses that already have um, business property. And, and the amount they will get will actually uh, depend on the rateable value of the property they, they own uh, uh, or occupy. And the, um, there will also be a discretionary element for local authorities, but we understand that's going to be, <clears throat> excuse me, relatively small amounts of cash. Um, uh, the 5% was mentioned in terms of 5% of what their overall allocation is. So this is not going to be huge, huge amounts of money. Um, and the job retention scheme, as we know, has been extended by at least a month. Um, and, and the local authorities are, I think today they will be getting more guidance because this goes through the, the business rating, um, the business rates rating authorities, uh, not through the county council. Um, and then there were, there were other elements. Some of you remember, even before we were talking about a national lockdown, um, there was talk of a winter economy um, plan and this included these additional measures. So they also are in place. So the self-employed income support scheme runs through till spring of next year. And there were those VAT cuts which were extended. And the, bit, the various business loans, I didn't want to put them all on the, on the slides, but various business loans, some for small businesses, some for large, um, they, they were originally a six year payback period that's been extended to 10 years. So there's, you could argue there's no question the government is certainly um, providing at least a degree of support um, across the economy and particularly for um, the sectors uh, most affected. Um, and then finally on impact, um, these, these are my words, these are not come from anywhere else, but I, I suppose I am just theorising for a second in that I would like to think um, the impact will be less significant than those numbers we were looking at earlier in terms of the March, April, where we saw GDP basically crashed by about 25%. Um, one is because it's very specific, the lockdown in terms of which businesses have to either cease trading or change their, their means of serving their markets. Um, businesses are far better prepared, or the majority are, to deal with compliance measures. Um, you know, we, we are in a more, uh, it's not less onerous, but it's, it's more familiar in a sense that the environment we're in. The government has already committed some level of funding at some level of support, but also probably the latter point is most critical, which is that both businesses and local authorities are generally more familiar with the processes for that support to be got to businesses and how businesses access it, et cetera. Uh, and, and obviously they're more familiar with the job retention scheme, et cetera, et cetera. So there's an element of the measures are there and uh, at least businesses know how to access the support that is available. So I'd like to, if nothing else, comfort myself that I think if you're trying to mitigate the negative impact on the economy of the national lockdown, we're probably in a better position now than we would have been the first time around when everyone was almost kind of trying to get used to the environment sort of um, within a ridiculously short space of time. Um, so I, I was just going to dangerously um, chair, hesitate for a second there before I go on to the next part of the presentation, just to see if there are any questions about the the, the sort of impact over the last few months and of course the, the, uh, the, the new scenario that we're moving into now. Thank you for that so far, David. Um, are there any questions, any hands going up? Any comments, any clarification? 
I don't see a mass of anything happening here, David. There's, there's just the one hand's just come up there. Who? Who's that? Councillor Collette. Ah, oh, yes, Adrian Collett. Thank you, um, Chairman, and uh, thank you, David, for the presentation, which is really helpful. I, I note that the um, number of employees who are affected by lockdown is estimated at 23%, and obviously that's a very worrying time for them and their businesses, and that's the main focus of what we're discussing this morning. I, I, I just want to make sure I've understood that correctly, because that would imply that 77% of employees are not affected by lockdown, and that then worries me that lockdown will not be effective and that we will see even darker days in the new year that will perhaps give us even more challenges. I just wonder if I've understood that correctly. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll try to keep my own head clear as well when I try to give you an answer. I think I, th I understand the point you're making. I, at the end of the day, um, the, the idea of the lockdown obviously is to minimise, um, you know, interaction between people as much as possible. Um, but what you obviously there are significant parts of the economy which can operate effectively. We've proved this over the last few months can operate effectively with remote working without without people having to go into their place of work. There are some exceptions, of course, you know, manufacturing being an obvious one um, where, where that, that just isn't physically possible. Um, and, and obviously a, a proportion of their activities have to be done physically. So you, you, you just can't you, you just can't get around that. But the, obviously the idea of, of lockdown is to try and absolutely minimise the number of people that physically have to uh, travel to work, et cetera, et cetera. So there are parts, huge parts of the economy that can actually operate. You know, if, pe if people are in any kind of, um, I don't know, digital financial services, the public sector, you know, uh, the huge parts of those parts of the economy that can continue to operate without people doing lots of travelling and moving and interacting with each other. So uh, I think that's where... The, um, in a sense, the, the lockdown sh should be effective. I think the um, what, what we've what we've identified there is that 23% is trying to estimate the proportion of employment in the the parts of the sectors that the government's guidance specifically relates to. That doesn't mean that 23% of people's jobs of, of jobs in the economy will necessarily be directly impacted in a negative way because some of those businesses will be able to continue to operate, albeit in a different way. So, you know, an obvious one would be um, the fact that, um, that that pubs, for example, can still do, they can do kind of home delivery takeaway type services. So they can still, um, and, and, and quite a few, um, a, a good example was, um, you know, um, food food wholesalers who, who, who were supplying or normally supply pubs, restaurants, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that they they switched quite rapidly to doing lots more home delivery. So I think you know the sectors have sort of adapted um, where they can to um, the new environment. And of course, some of those businesses that had to adapt in the earlier part of this year will will probably switch back into that mode for the next month. So I think the the, the overall picture I was trying to paint was I'm not trying to um, underestimate the, the the impact. I'm just saying. I think the the economy generally is 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 more familiar and more is better prepared now to operate in this sort of environment. Um, I think <laughs> I suppose the, the 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 softer issue around the effectiveness of lockdown is how compliant people are, and that's clearly mm. something mm. that is 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 sort of out of my um, sphere of expertise. But but that's clearly something which um, I know there was there was some quite sort of. Um, there were some stronger messages, weren't there, from from authorities like the police? I think in the media today about you know being much more active about making sure that people are at least following following the rules. But but no, you're right. I, th I think that the I would say the reassuring thing is that there are huge parts of the economy which will be able to continue. I think that's the positive. Mm. Okay, yeah. thank you for that. Thank uh, you. Is that enough for you for the moment, Adrian? Or do you want to come back? No, that's fine, Jonathan. Thank you. Right. Um, you know, other hands. Have I missed any other hands? If not, if I haven't, back to you, David. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, so I'm now moving now into that. Um, as I say, the engagement with some different parts of the economy. Um, we we obviously this is not specific to the national lockdown or anything. This is part of our ongoing engagement to try to identify one which measures have actually helped in the short term. 
but also, of course, looking beyond the current situation, uh, what are the kinds of things that we might want to put in place, we might want to support, which actually would um, ensure that we have a sort of more resilient economy in the future. But the two examples I have today, uh, one is around innovation, which is the thematic one, and, the, and also one around rural, which is obviously slightly more sectoral um, in terms of the types of businesses that, that operate in, in rural Hampshire. So first of all, in terms of the thematic innovation, um, I think most of us recognise that um, Hampshire and the South East generally, one of its key strengths economically is that it's a strong area for research and development for innovation. Um, in Hampshire, as well as having four universities, of which the University of Southampton in particular is a very strong research university, we also have organisations like Kinetic, which are obviously nowadays a private sector business, but they are huge um, um, areas of activity in terms of um, technology, particularly for the defence, aerospace, marine sectors, and a huge part of Hampshire's strength as an economy. And, and innovation, I would argue, is one of those bedrocks on which a, the UK's future prosperity will continue to, um, to depend. Um, we we organised a, um, a roundtable, a, a discussion session with a number of key stakeholders in the innovation arena um, in Hampshire. So this included people like Kinetic, Set Squared, which is the, the tech incubator uh, organisation, uh, we had the universities, we had the Science Park at Chilworth, we had Oxford Innovation. So we had a number of key players, some coming at it from slightly different perspectives, to discuss how we ensure in the future Hampshire is an effective innovation ecosystem. Now, this was one of those meetings where uh, one of my colleagues said, oh, should we should we have scheduled you know, a number of future meetings of this group? And I said, oh, no, let's, let's have the conversation first and see if there's an appetite to... To, 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 to meet again. Well, I have to say this is one of those groups where um, there was such a, a pent-up demand, I think, for, for, for this kind of engagement, and, and this group will definitely continue to meet. So, in a way, it was, it was um, reassuring that there was that appetite, but it also meant you could see the potential in the future of some of these parties engaging more frequently. Um, and a couple of one, one of the people, sorry, the, one of the chap there, bottom left, is is a guy called Chris Haley, who's from uh, Nesta, which do a lot of research around business, enterprise, innovation, and we asked them to come along and present to the group, almost just to get the kind of conversation going. Um, one one of the things they've worked on over a number of years is looking at which businesses actually generate um, employ new jobs in the economy. And one of the key characteristics is that they tend to be innovative companies. Um, and this is just a, a slide demonstrating how um, innovative firms actually tend to grow, whether it's in terms of revenue or employment, twice as fast as those businesses that don't. Um, so even if you just selfishly as a place want businesses that are going to generate jobs, um, actually um, having more businesses that are in the innovation space is is um, definitely something you want to aspire to. Uh, this is a slightly more sobering uh, graph uh, uh, which looks at the UK against all the other um, OECD countries, uh, of which there are 37. Um, and, and I think most of us would probably have put the UK higher in that graph in terms of where we sit in terms of, of R&D. Um, and actually, uh, we don't. We, we're very sort of middle table there. So. I think there is certainly lots of room for uh, increasing further the level of innovation in the UK and clearly we would want to um, ensure that Hampshire is a you know is, is a player in that in, in that agenda and then these are just a couple of slides really to kind of summarize some of the key points that came out of the discussion first one is is around just the general point that all the partners on this call were all saying we need to be far more better connected there was a a, there was a chap on this call called Professor Bob Nicholl, who is the Pro Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation at the University of Portsmouth. He's only been in that post for about 18 months. I spoke to him about mm, three or four months ago, and he said, one of my big frustrations is that I, there isn't a network for me to plug into that gets me beyond Portsmouth. Um, so actually, this, 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 this event, this discussion was sort of manna from heaven for him because it was exactly what he wanted. He wanted to become plugged into a wider network of innovation-orientated organisations. 
Um, one of the, if you like, almost frustrations that came out, or one of the, the issues that was raised was, was around government support around innovation. They have an organisation called Innovate UK, but it's sort of national and it's not that easy for particularly small businesses to interface with it. Um, and there are too many initiatives, too many schemes that pop up and disappear and quite difficult for business to keep track of them. And then, and then a couple of other things that came out of the discussion. Uh, two of the universities, the University of Southampton, the University of Portsmouth, um, both following this conversation are now talking about looking at the possibility of establishing a centre of excellence in, life, in emerging life science technologies. We already have um, a concentration of life science businesses across Hampshire, um, and um, it would be fascinating, wouldn't it, if we actually got two of our universities that actually don't collaborate very much at all to actually collaborate around an agenda which um, they share in Hampshire. And um, I think that's, you know, if, if even the fact that that's being talked about now is is is, is a massive, massive positive. Um, they, they were talking about for the possibility of establishing a scale up entrepreneurship program. What does that mean? I mean, King's College um, in London actually already has an entrepreneurship institute, which is basically a way of not just instilling uh, sort of the enterprise culture in um, in young people, but it's also about guiding them and mentoring them in how to establish and grow a business, particularly one that's orientated around uh, innovative products and services. So. To have something, anything like that in Hampshire, would be uh, would be a massive plus. And then there's a there's a broader range of sort of environmental issues that that mean you're more likely to be able to support innovative businesses. So you know, access to finance is an obvious one. Um, infrastructure that could be labs, clean rooms, um, the science part would be a good example. Um, um, obviously, talented people, and and of course access to markets, but not just access to markets, but access to environments in which you can test and trial um, technology as well, because that's really important. You know, if you want to ultimately sell your products to the NHS, you have to be able to test and trial them in a an NHS type environment. Um, so that those sorts of issues are are critical. But the main point here is that we've got these partners together. And now there's some very interesting conversations going forward so that it's not just a talking shop. It's actually something focused on some specific initiatives, which I think is uh, encouraging. And then in terms of the, the rural discussions, we, we brought together about three different groups on different themes. One was around the kind of tourism and hospitality sector. One was around business and enterprise. And one was much more around kind of community, community, community orientated activity. And they, these slides just very briefly summarise some of the key points that came out of the first two groups of those. So first of all, in terms of tourism and hospitality, uh, an issue I didn't think would arise, but it was actually one of the key points made was how critical, particularly in the current circumstances, the sort of networks have proved to be. Uh, so networks like Go New Forest, which is the tourism promotion body for the New Forest, which is a membership organisation, Hampshire Fair, which a lot of the people on the, on the committee will be familiar with. Um, which used to be at one time part of the county council, um, and, and why was that? Why were they important? I think it's because they were seen as sort of trusted friends, trusted sources of information and support, and also because you'd actually got an organisation that was championing your cause or championing the cause of your sector. Um, so Hampshire Fair, for example, instigated a, a, a stay loyal, stay local campaign to encourage people to. To, to, to continue to buy local, even when the supermarkets were starting to, to, to be restocked. Um, so, so just interesting that they found those networks kind of um, a, a more, probably more important than we anticipated. Um, demand, I guess, was there, there were pluses and minuses here. The staycation sort of, you know, uh, agenda, yes, that's a positive. There was maybe more demand in a sense locally, but then of course all the social distancing rules limited capacity and, and, and constrained viability of some of these businesses. Um, some of you may or may not be familiar with the LEADER programme, which is a rural focused business support programme. Um, that's been that's proved to be a very valued resource, not just in terms of COVID-19, but before that. Um, we, we have a Lodden and Test programme, which the County Council is the accountable body for, and that's proved to be the most successful LEADER programme in the whole of the country. Um, why do we think LEADER has, has been successful it's been successful because one it's been around for some time 
So businesses and the offices delivering those that support are familiar with it. And also the offices, in our case, a lady called Emily Preston, who's actually led that program. Um, she's become very, very familiar with the businesses, the business community that she operates in. So I think there's something there for the government in terms of a lesson, which is making sure some of these support schemes are around for some time so that both businesses and uh, the offices delivering the support become adept at, at ensuring that businesses get the support they need. Um, some frustrations, one of which will be no surprise. We've sort of touched on this earlier in the conversation with the LEPs around broadband coverage, but particularly, of course, businesses in rural locations wanting to move to more online bookings or online sales. Um, and and, and Cathy Slack did mention some of these small grant schemes through European funding, through ERDF. Uh, the big challenge there, and Cathy sort of hinted at it, was they were completely oversubscribed, that there was nothing like the level of funding that was required relative to the, relative to the demand. And then in terms of business and enterprise, Outdoor activities, um, much less impacted, I guess it's what you'd expect because they're operating in what effectively is a, is a more sort of safe outdoor environment. Um, food and drink producers just had to be very, very quick at finding alternative routes to market. Um, where they did that successfully, they've managed to maintain their turnover and retain most of their staff in productive roles. Uh, but clearly that, that required you know, moving to things like the online sales, etc., which is quite difficult for businesses that are normally used to selling or, or supplying to pubs and restaurants to suddenly be selling to Joe Public. That's that's not something that's easy to do overnight. Um, and, and interestingly enough, the FSB, uh, the Federation of Small Businesses, was delivering free online mentoring, and quite a few businesses had found that of value. Some of the other issues that came out were probably not COVID-19 specific, some, some slight challenges that, that were raised around planning, particularly in terms of diversification of buildings um, uh, and, of course, Brexit, EU exit, whatever term you want to use, a key issue for some rural, rural businesses. Um, concerns around the end of the job retention scheme, although obviously that's been slightly pushed back, but I think we have those concerns as well in terms of what happens in terms of those sectors that have been most impacted and also i think something slightly more positive is has the whole pandemic actually increased our consciousness in terms of of buying local and the, and the positives that come with that not not just in terms of knowing where food and drink and everything else has been sourced from but actually the fact that you're also supporting local jobs and local businesses by doing so um so um before i i'm just going to get on the, the, the there are just three more slides here which is sort of feeding into some of that intelligence that we've gathered from some of that engagement in terms of what our emerging priorities are short medium long term and then what i'll do chair again is is take a breath and just see if there are any further questions so in terms of um our priorities in the short term obviously we've got the continued one about government support for businesses making sure those businesses that are eligible uh, particularly during the, lock, the, the national lockdown, that they access that, that support. Uh, there's definitely something around tourism support. That's probably less applicable in the next month, but certainly that's a sector that needs to be supported, particularly through the winter months, where obviously they normally have a, a leaner time. Um, our Hampshire Futures colleagues have been doing some fantastic work around particular initiatives. Some were pre, there pre-COVID, but they've become even more critical in that context around how we leverage the benefit of some major projects to create construction related skills and training opportunities. The Kickstart Scheme, which is national, Hampshire County Council doing its bit to try and ensure young people can access some of those work placement opportunities. So that those, as I say, some of those things were there before, but they've obviously become even more critical components of the support going forward. Um, something around the cruise sector, probably more of a national agenda than just a local one, but clearly it has a disproportionate uh, uh, significance for Hampshire because um, Southampton in particular, obviously very dependent on that sector um, and supply chains associated with the cruise sector that are based locally. Um, we all know about Southampton Airport and it's, it's, um, its outstanding planning application to be determined for the runway extension. You know, that, that on many levels is, is, is quite a, a significant um, decision um, in terms of not just the specifics of the airport, but in a sense, 
the, 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 the sort of longer term almost credentials that Hampshire has as a, as a business location. Um, and then also there's something around local retail. We've already touched on some of this in the rural context, but how do you ensure that um, our, our local retailers can, can maybe become a bit more e-commerce orientated rather than just relying on, on, on their own uh, physical shops and actually having just becoming more flexible in terms of the way they access the market and providing customers with the same sorts of services they can get from national retailers. That's really where we're, we're possibly trying to, to, to support them. In terms of the medium term, I think there's a bit more of a debate. Maybe this is where the let's come in as well is, is, is around business support in terms of how we, um, how do we ensure the, the, the financial support um, is, is easy for businesses to, to navigate themselves through. It isn't at the moment, it's still very complex. And I think that could, that could be some further simplified. We've talked about innovation and I think that's something we want to continue to support. There, there is something around work hubs and urban centres. Um, clearly, the county council is largely working remotely at the moment. You know, what does that mean for future business operating models, and how does that then impact on the market for office space, etc.? Something we're looking at uh, at the moment in terms of do we need to start looking at more flexible types of models uh, in a more dispersed sense rather than just big headquarters buildings um, and digital connectivity. We've talked about. Some of you will have seen the proposals in Portsmouth and Southampton for these full fibre to premises uh, proposals, um, and we're probably going to see those sorts of projects emerge um, elsewhere across across Hampshire. And then finally, in terms of the long term, I've already mentioned free ports, and if we've got time, we can touch on that um, after this slot. Um, but could David, is this your, your last button. slide before your break? It, it is. It is. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, so, so I can come back to that if we have time. There is something about large regeneration housing and infrastructure projects, which would we we would be progressing anyway and supporting anyway, but they probably again a little bit like the skills agenda become even more um, critical in the sense that they will not only have an immediate positive impact in the local construction sector, but also of course we want to accelerate the benefits that comes from some of that investment. Um, of course, there's something around green recovery, low carbon, um, partly related to our Commission of Inquiry findings. Um, there, is, there is a proposal which Southern Policy Centre has started to develop around whether we need to agree a set of key principles against which future projects are measured. And that might be one of the ways in which we more meaningfully achieve some of the outcomes we want to achieve there. And then finally, the circular economy term is something that's being used more and more. I think what we have to determine in Hampshire is what we actually mean by that, because um, it can mean a lot of things. Um, but actually, one of the really sort of low hanging fruit items is genuinely how do you ensure, particularly some of your anchor institutions, and that could include the county council, of course, we've mentioned the universities, those big players in Hampshire, should we be genuinely and consciously ensuring that as much as possible, they, they source uh, supplies, products, services, etc., as, as locally as they possibly can, because that would be something you could directly, you could influence, and it would have a direct impact immediately on um, the local economy in a positive sense. So, but these are probably some of these are sort of in that more medium to long term um, uh, agenda. So that that that's that's that bit, um, chair. So I will. I'm happy to. Thank you, uh, take, take questions. You're, you're clearly uh, a man who knows his subject. OK, there's some hands coming up here, starting with the Councillor Westbrook. Mike. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, David, for, for the presentation. Um, I wanted to go back to your slide on innovation on page 26, when you, which is actually was a negative on innovation in relation to the government support and too many initiatives. Yeah. I wonder who's feeding back to government to tell them to tell them that. and and that it's probably a waste of resources and needs to be more streamlined and more targeted. Yeah, I was I was fortunate. Thank you for the question. I was fortunate that 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 um, well, maybe that's the wrong term, but I thought it was fortunate at the time to be invited by MHCLG. They they were um, convening a number of um, groups around specific themes in relation to economic recovery. And one of them um, which I was invited to was actually primarily focused around, can you believe it, tourism and rural, I think. It wasn't about innovation. But I did 
use that and I use the leader program as a sort of example of a best practice rather than you know where I thought there were there were issues but I did get across the point that there is a wider acknowledgement if you talk to local authorities they you can see all the nodding heads if ever I'm on a group saying any of this stuff they're all nodding so everyone agrees even the leps I think is that the landscape of business support generally is just too complex there are there are, I mean you know even now if you go on the COVID-19 uh, page of gov.uk you know every, every scheme and everything has got a name and, and we, we just kind of we just love this this sort of you know this branding of everything which which I kind of understand because I know I know I know that ministers want to be able to announce things and everything else but I think the problem is for businesses it just becomes this this alphabet soup of different names and schemes some of which are time constrained um, and and I think what you need is is some forms of support where they're around consistently for a number of years so that businesses understand them and the officers like myself and my colleagues become familiar with them and know how best to uh, enable businesses to access that support and that applies in the innovation sphere as well so if I'm honest I, I certainly use every opportunity I get when I'm talking to government um, to actually make those points and, and if I'm honest when you talk to the civil servants um, most of them, I think, acknowledge this, um, and and um, I think, the, of course, we were hoping the CSR would actually start to get into some of this territory, but that's kind of been pushed back. So we, some of those points that have been made have probably, uh, we probably we probably need to make them again, to be honest. Yeah, Mike. Th yeah, Mike. thanks, David. I mean, I just just briefly, yeah. I mean, I, I, I'd add I would add to that that obviously we we all need to better have less com complex um, arrangements. I think acronyms come into that as well, Bob, to be honest. I mean, you know, you see all these different companies, uh, sorry, different initiatives coming up with different names. And I, I mean, it's confusing for everybody, I think, and uh, to streamline that and make it more simple, much, much more effective. Thank you very much for that response. Okay. No problem. Thank you very much. Um, and Roger Huckster. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, David, for your comprehensive uh, presentation. They usually are, and they're usually very interesting. And today in particular, can I, go back to slide 20, the histogram of your blue and red columns. Uh, is there an explanation why, uh, shall we say, the, the greater intensity of business R&D on the left-hand side, on the left-hand side of the slide, uh, the blue columns are taller than the red columns. But as we come down the histogram moving right, uh, red columns are dominating the blue columns. Is there an explanation for that? I'm, I'm fascinated by the question. I'm always, what I'm going to do now is, is go back and actually put the thing up on the screen because I, I, th this is a slide, as I say, that was actually put together by by Nesta. Um, and, and if you look at the um, the um, what I what I think it relates to is, and I, I don't know the exact calculation, but I can I can certainly after the meeting come back to you with more detail but if you look at the bottom where it obviously explains the the unadjusted is the blue and the adjusted i think what they've done there is that they as it says at the top is is um on on the on the red they've adjusted for the industrial structure one assumes that's partly because um sectorally some parts of the economy in any country are more invest in innovation orientated than others so one assumes there's that there must be something in this where they they feel that the unadjusted alone doesn't in a sense do complete justice to the exercise so uh, I, I what i need to check is what the a bit more detail if you like uh, of what the adjusted means in terms of because it does say they're adjusted for industrial structure but i can certainly get you i'm not going to waffle now um because that's what i'd be doing um uh, I, I will, but I will definitely um, find out for you uh, what the background is to the difference. Because you're right, if you take the adjusted um, and take, um, in a sense, the um, the graph would be slightly different, wouldn't it, if you ranked it purely in the adjusted? Um, I think, and and to be fair, even the very title of the slide is saying we're we're below the average, even when you adjust for the. Uh, the industrial structure we are we are not certainly not top of the table or anywhere near the top of the table yes i, I think it's important to find out because it could be that the answer to the question is could be the driver of uh, gbr moving left on that diagram 
Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, I have to, and I will be the first to admit that um, uh, certainly Nesta are, are uh, one of the reasons why I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I use them as a credible source is because they are completely independent. They are not driven by any particular agenda, so they are uh, they are trying to look at this as objectively as they possibly can. So. Uh, there'll be no skewing from Nesta's perspective, but, uh, but I, we, it will be useful to understand what the rationale is between that adjustment. Thank you. I, I can certainly find that out for you. Very interesting. Good questions. Um, right, well, we're OK for time. Um, if you want to carry on, David, since you've got some spare. Yeah, this, this, this will not take long, um, but I thought it would be interesting in the context of that, particularly as I've flagged Freeport as being possibly a, a longer term opportunity for Hampshire. Uh, there's only about four or five slides here, I think. Just for those that aren't as familiar, uh, back in February of this year, obviously before we went into any kind of lockdown or anything, um, there was a, a national consultation launched by government around the concept of Freeports. And this was really on the back of, I guess, primarily um, our exit from the EU and how do we ensure that uh, we use as many mechanisms as possible that, that we continue to be a, a successful trading nation internationally. And one of the, the concepts of the free ports was to create um, zones associated with either ports or airports, which effectively provide a range of incentives, uh, whether that be in relation to customs, whether that in relation to tax, whether it re was in relation to planning. So lots of different uh, potential incentives that the government would effectively um, offer through these, uh, these, these, these areas, these zones associated with other say ports or airports. So the consultation ended in July. We responded along with lots of other stakeholders. The government then uh, came back with effectively a sort of summary of the responses. Um, and this is really just a snapshot now of where we're up to with the process. And we anticipate the competitive process, it will be competitive process, to be triggered um, either side of Christmas. It could be before Christmas, it might, might be just after. Um, and um, first of all, and, and this is not me being biased, this is just a reality, is, is the Chancellor of the Exchequer actually announced the free ports concept um, from the south of the port of Southampton. So, I, I'm sort of reading that as a, as a fairly heavy hint that he expected the port of Southampton, which is the the, lot, the, the, the leading UK export port, um, to maybe feature in a proposal put forward when the bidding process starts. But um, one can never assume such, but um, I certainly read it that um, he saw Southampton port as, as one of the possible contenders here. Um, so I, I talk, I've really talked through a lot of this in terms of what the vision is. It's not just about trade, though. That's the interesting thing. They, they, they've tried to build in a lot of other dimensions. So the, the last point there is about global trade, which is fine. I think the, the other point, though, is they want these to be centres where you see uh, regeneration happen, where you see innovation happen. So um, that's actually sort of some of that is a challenge. We'll come on to that in a second, because in Hampshire, we don't have swathes of brownfield sites ready to be redeveloped like you might have in somewhere like Teesside or you might have at London Gateway or what have you. So, but we'll come back to that in a second. But they very much, they're trying to tick lots of boxes, housing, innovation, regeneration, you know, if we can get them all, that would be brilliant, as well as the trading element. This is part of the sort of feedback from the consultation processes um, that they very much want to see um, a, a, a collaborative approach across uh, regions. So they want to see business, they want to see universities, as well as the ports and the um, um, and, and the local authorities and the LEPs. And, and they will like, they will really want the local authorities and LEPs to be behind whatever proposals come forward. Um, I've already mentioned the uh, the prospect the the bidding prospectus. We anticipate that being late this year. Um, and, and they actually would like, which is very ambitious, that, that these free ports to be at least kicking off, as in uh, being able to offer those incentives, et cetera, by late next year. Um, so quite an ambitious programme. I've touched on this in terms of the, the incentives, so something around customs. So, so I suppose a very good example would be, I think their vision is one where you'd have um, maybe a port and a, an, 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 an associated uh, free port zone 
where you could have, for example, a manufacturing plant and you could have components imported from the EU or elsewhere in the world assembled on site and then exported and they would never effectively touch the UK from a customs perspective. So that's sort of the, 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 the simplified version of the model. But I also want there to be uh, tax relief in terms of uh, capital allowances around private investment. So if somebody was, was investing in a major manufacturing plant, then actually um, you know, they'd get the um, cap, uh, 100, potentially 100% capital allowance, which is not effectively a grant, what it is, it, but it's quite a useful uh, cash flow incentive for businesses to be able to put all of that capital investment against a particular tax year. Um, other, other things around flexibilities I mentioned around planning, not quite clear yet how that will happen, but certainly something around accelerated planning uh, so, so that effectively, you know, there aren't long delays in actually getting the investment to move forward. And also a little bit like the enterprise zones, the government providing specific funding streams in relation to infrastructure for the free ports. This is where the, the government has moved the goalposts a little bit, because at one time they, they seem to be saying, oh, you could put forward a regional bid, which would actually cover a number of sites in a region. Now they're saying it primarily needs to be a single contiguous site. Um, associated with a port or airport, obviously very large there in terms of scale, but actually it, it does have to be a site you can draw a single red line around. So you can't have, you know, for example, in Hampshire, we, we can't have, you know, Southampton Airport, the port of Southampton and, and anywhere else, you know, it has to be quite a, a kind of co coherent, if you like, um, area that's been uh, promoted. Um, but they do give you a, a much bigger outer boundary in terms of um, the wider benefits, if you like, the, the wider economic influence of, of the free port. Uh, all of this obviously to be um, confirmed within the bidding prospectus. Um, so this is the final slide. Um, some, some key questions. Um, who leads, coordinates the bid? At the moment, the Solent Lep have acted as a sort of convener of the key players, including Portsmouth Port, Southampton Airport, Port of Southampton, etc. Um, um, whether that continues to be the case, um, and whether we'd want, for example, if it was if it was if it was a Port of Southampton, would we want um, ABP to lead it? Uh, that's all up, up for grabs. Um, does the applicant need to be a special purpose vehicle? Do we have to create a limited? company or a development corporation or something that would would actually deliver this um, that that has been raised by the consultants who've been advising the servant let um, i've already mentioned this uh, they, the government definitely wants to see all local planning authorities on board because they see planning as one of the key incentives or accelerated planning as the key in, one of the key incentives um, of course the key question for hampshire is on which sites is our proposal based there is a school of thought and I confess I'm one of the people in that school of thought, which is it probably should be primarily focused on the port of Southampton and the water side, which includes the Mar includes Marchand Military Port, uh, the Exxon Mobil Refinery, which is a port in its own right, and Fawley Water side. Um, and of course, the area, the land that ABP are, are looking to, to, to expand on in terms of their operations. That would make a very neat kind of um, contiguous area to focus on. Uh, but but of the Portsmouth contingent, surprise, surprise, are are also lobbying for, 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 for them to be included. Um, but I would I, my final point really is 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 just a factual one, which the, the bid needs to be compelling. Uh, it needs to be competitive, but it also needs to make sense at a UK level. So this is not about kind of local parochialism. This is about what is the proposal that would have the biggest impact. Um, at a, at a UK level, because that's ultimately what the government's talking about. It's talking about only having something like 10 of these free ports. So you're going to have to be sort of a, the, the case is going to have to be significant to get yourself into that, into that 10. So that is, that is my final slide, Chair. So happy to take any remaining questions uh, on, on that final piece. Right. Well, David, thank, thank you very much, David. Um, perfect timing. Um, no, I don't see any hands up. Is there, is there, are there any comments anybody would like to make from the uh, member member of the committee? Uh, Russell Oppenheimer. 
Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, David, for the presentations this morning. It's been very illuminating. We've had some really useful and fruitful discussions on the economy at ETE committee over the last three years. And uh, as David moves on to pastures new, I wanted to just take the opportunity to thank him and wish him all the best in Derby. Thank you, David. Well, that's, thank you for that. Yeah, that's that's um, um, that's the best question we've had all morning. That one. No, 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 but no, Russell. I, I I really appreciate your comments. Um, and 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 you know what I would say is I I've absolutely thoroughly uh, and genuinely enjoyed um working in Hampshire and working for the county council. Um, and um, it, it it you know a lot of this at the moment is quite challenging. But I think a lot of the fundamentals of Hampshire are very, very sound. And um, so long as, as it's managed sensibly that the agenda going forward, I, I, I still see a very, very positive future for this part of the world. So, um, yeah, no, it's it's it, it's been great, great to work here. And hopefully uh, I, I've left it just a little bit better than it was when I arrived. That's all I can say. Uh, Russell, thank you very much for bringing that to my attention. I did not realise this, actually. Um, obviously, I'm behind on the curve here. Um, as there are no other hands up, uh, David, um, I don't know how long you've been with us. How long have you been with us? I've been about eight and a half years now. Okay. Um, um, how do I say this without sounding uh, patronising? Look, I'd like to say thank you very much, A, for today's presentation, and B, to thank you for all the service you have given to Hampshire County Council over those years. Um, I'm always sorry to see officers go because you, you get a knowledge of the area and that knowledge um, is, you know, you can pull on it at any point throughout any meeting the longer you're with the county. So wisdom comes with, with, with knowledge. Um, so I wish you all the very best in Derby and uh, please keep in touch with us, okay? Absolutely. And, and, and strangely enough, I'm already in discussions about one of the services that I currently manage is our economic and business intelligence service, which Ivan Perkovich um, leads on. And um, I'm already talking to Ivan about the possibility of him doing some work for Derby City Council. So uh, if, if nothing else, at least I can possibly sort of um, um, provide a little bit of income for one of our services going forward. So, you know, that's that's the least I can do if, if, if I can uh, pull that one off anyway. Who, who do we, who, who's going to be the new economic recovery officer so so um i think stuart jarvis is in the process of um arranging uh obviously there's, there's a formal um recruitment process being triggered for my replacement um but i think he will be putting some interim arrangements in place as well so i'm I, i'm assuming that's something that stuart will confirm um very shortly i think because i i am here until the end of this year Thank you very much. I presume we can use these slides for any um, any uh, magazines we want to write for locally in our any of our divisions. Yeah, there's, there's nothing in there that's uh, that's confidential or sensitive. No, it's it's. Um, I mean, you know, obviously most of it is data orientated. Um, some of it's a little bit um, obviously interpretation or what have you. But no, th there's no sensitivity in the information there. Right. Look, thank you, David. Um, the uh, I'd like to say, are we happy to accept this report? Um, members and to um, with regards to uh, the recovery of the economy in Hampshire a, a yes or a thumb will be great thank you very much great would that be everybody uh, right thank you very much indeed we'll take that as read David we're very grateful and we'll get on to the next item which is our That's last very kind of you. and thank you to all of you for your attention and I, I and don't don't worry Roger I've not forgotten your question I will come back to you on that thank right. you David very much no worries. Okay. Right. And eight, one, one, one. Have a good day. Right. Thank you. Now, we are now moving on to the item of Hampshire Community Safety, which is our last item, with Graham Allen and Rob Ormerod. Now, I've got from 12 to 12.30 on this one, actually. Louise, is this a time limit that we've got with them? Um, somewhat, but um, the officers may well be able to elaborate on the, on the timings for their, for their report. I wanted to give everybody a five minute break. That was all, uh, if they wanted it. Can the, are the officers just giving us half an hour? Uh, half an hour? So we've, we've got a relatively brief 
uh, presentation of the report itself. So 20 to 25 minutes would be ample for us. We'll, we'll speak for a few minutes and then open for questions. Are we all happy just to continue? Everybody, thumbs up or a wave will do. Okay, right, if you have to leave, just blank yourself out. Okay, right, uh, uh, Rob and Graham. Uh, Graham, Rob, would you please, uh, you can start up, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Councillor Glenn. So it's Graham Allen here from, from Adults Health and Care speaking first. I'm just gonna give uh, an introduction to this report and then uh, hand over to my colleague, uh, Rob Ormerod in a moment or two. So this report before you is, is an annual update in terms of the Hampshire Community Safety Strategy Group. This is, an, as I say, an annual update on work taking place across the County of Hampshire with a wide range of partners. And you can see uh, within uh, paragraph five of the report, the variety of, of partners that are part and parcel of this arrangement. It's district borough councils, it's the military, it's Hampshire Constabulary, it's the fire service, it's a whole range of key agencies from both the statutory but also the voluntary and community sector. So essentially the, uh, the Community Safety Strategy Group uh, looks at key risks that may be faced across uh, our communities in Hampshire and then the actions that are being undertaken to reduce and mitigate them. And it's co-ordered and, and overseen uh, by senior officers from all of those partner agencies. The responsibility uh, for making sure that we've identified risks and then have uh, accompanying actions and mitigations in place is one that sits with Hampshire County Council. And the arrangement uh, currently is being chaired by myself from an officer perspective. In preparation of this report, uh, we've provided a briefing to the Executive Member for Communities, Partnerships and External Affairs. And a version of this report will be going forward to Cabinet on the 24th of, of November. Uh, so members, it, it is important uh, for me just to, to underline um, that in terms of coming forward with this report, we do that on an annual basis. It's very important from a constitutional assurance and governance perspective that this report comes forward uh, to policy and resources uh, select and also then goes on to cabinet uh, in due course. At that point, I'm going to pause and hand over to Rob Ormerod and Rob will pick up some of the key elements within the report. Thank you. Thank you, Al Graham. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so this this report, as Graham says, you know, gives um, gives a flavour of some of the activity around the key priorities, and I'm just going to sort of go through them fairly quickly. And I appreciate that the range of partnership activity that's overseen by the, the county group is very, very wide. It ranges from everything from violent crime to domestic abuse to preventative work with young people and, and so forth. Now, you, you may have specific interests or queries on this, and we normally have um, a, a lengthier slot whereby we invite some of our partners and leads to, to give a more detailed um, session um, but um, today we don't, so that if there are specific uh, lines of inquiry, queries, areas of interest, and you wanted to, um, to, to let us have those, I think Louise said she was happy to collect um, those by email. We can provide written responses in more detail, but I'm just going to give a, a very brief overview, really. Um, so our priorities are set out um, starting on the paragraph eight and um, the, the first one is around the threat of serious and organized crime especially related to the county lines activity and last uh, in previous years you've, you've, you've had specific updates um, and detailed presentations on this so the group has really um, been learning from the constabulary around the activity on county lines, the state of the drug market, and some of the um, some of, of the activity, uh, enforcement activity and disruption activity under Operation Monument, uh, being undertaken by the constabulary. And what's really important for the group is how that links together um, with um, with wider partners around protecting those who are 
who are vulnerable, particularly children, to, to grooming um, on, county, on county lines, um, particularly linking with the work of the missing, endangered and trafficked teams, um, and also looking at the work in school and the work of preventative um, youth crime prevention work with the youth offending team and, and other partners. So the group has, uh, has been looking, having an overview of that and being assured that the, there is um, there is strong partnership activity to look at the different aspects of the problem from enforcement down to prevention, prevention um, both in schools but also targeting those people, for example, excluded children who remain a high uh, a high concern, especially during COVID. And I think it's probably also worth mentioning um, generally that uh, to, to add to Graham's introduction that we have continued to meet very successfully with very strong uh, engagement at senior level by all partners throughout the period of COVID and we've been looking particularly at the impact of COVID on some of these priorities and some of the partnership activity and some of the uh, issues in relation to community safety. Um, so priority um, priority two um, relates to serious violence, and we did update our uh, our action plan and our strategic assessment with this national priority around uh, what is effectively the knife crime agenda, um, and and overseen the, the group has overseen and signed off the. Um, the problem profile and the response plan. We have a multi-agency partnership around serious violence at the moment. We have some uh, now well established, we have some limited um, and time limited funding from the Home Office to, uh, to establish this, um, which is in terms of the nature of the funding, it's not very helpful in terms of its short term nature and the long term nature of the problems we're trying to address. So we're trying to embed the approach led by the Director of Public Health uh, across business as usual and embedding this priority and, and um, funneling the, some of the funding into building capacity around youth crime prevention, um, around protecting young people affected by county, at risk of county lines grooming, around school-based interventions, around some rehabilitation for the um, 18 to 24 year old group as well um, about developing our frontline workforce skills and knowledge and around uh, some the number of grant schemes we have for community schemes to support young people um, in, in diverting them away from, from some of those risks. Um, the next one is a, a complex area largely led by the Director of P Public Health but with a wide range of partnerships and I think the thing to say here is that certainly throughout COVID as you will appreciate the issues and the interconnected issues around mental ill health, substance misuse, domestic abuse uh, and adverse childhood experiences have, have come to the fore. There have been increases in demand for services um, around mental health, around substance misuse, around domestic abuse. And the important point here, as particularly during COVID, is that we that those services have remained open and they've, they've adapted to the increase in demand uh, and they've been delivered in new ways, including through digital in, in interventions, which actually has been very successful, particularly with some with some young young people. There's been quite a lot of um, strategic alignment across these agendas and in the governance arrangements which the, the group has overseen given that they are in, interconnected. Um, just skipping through, the, the next one really, um, and this is obviously pertinent at the moment as the threat level has just been increased, is the continued threat of radical extremism. Um, we have a very strong part, prevent partnership board which is part of the, the counter-terrorism uh, contest strategy nationally um, with, with 
statutory duties around working with partners to to share information and to provide a, a, an intervention for those people who um, are at risk, are identified and referred uh, as at risk of radical extremism. There is a separate short report going to Cabinet on the prevent work and um, this gives a, a flavour of the key areas of work. I don't know whether Graham just um, wanted to say a particular word about prevent agenda. Yeah, thank you. So as, as Rob says, um, we, we have specific duties and responsibilities under the Counterterrorism and Security Act 2015 as an upper tier local authority with regard to prevent. And a separate report is, is going forward to Cabinet again on the 24th of November. What we've seen uh, both through the work that we uh, do both as a local authority but with a wide range of partners uh, are some key risks across our communities with regard to uh, radicalization and of course prevent operates in the cr pre-criminal space so it works both to support uh, children young people and adults who may be referred uh, for support and uh, risks are not only from uh, uh, fundamentalism uh, from from an Islamic perspective but moreover from an extreme right-wing ideology and what we have seen is, is an increasing uh, risk, clearly as we've uh, collectively across public services and, and as households, as whole communities have shifted increasingly online, certainly through the course of the first lockdown that started uh, in March and April of this year, we've seen a 29% increase in terms of uh, internet usage by uh, households, just generally. And of course, what that opens up is, is greater risk of, of uh, ideologies and manipulation through messages that are promulgated through uh, internet, internet based uh, websites uh, and information. So we are very uh, conscious of, of risk. There's a huge amount of work done through the Prevent Partnership Board, again, with a wide range of statutory and voluntary uh, partners. And we also have a very well formed internal prevent delivery group, which has membership across uh, every department of Hampshire County Council because the responsibilities are broad with regard to uh, use of our buildings, our facilities and our services. So there's a huge amount of work that's already uh, in place. It's well supported corporately. It's well supported across uh, the wider community in Hampshire. I'll pause there, but I'm happy to take any questions that members may have in due course. Uh, thank you very much. Is that is that both of you? You finished yeah. too, Robert? Have you? If I can just complete very briefly, I'll, I will I will be brief on these. But we are, we all also have priorities going on to I think section 31 on your report. Uh, one of our priorities is around um, ensuring inclusion and cohesion in a changing society. So um, this. This covers a multitude of issues uh, around hate crime and around cohesion um, and something which is obviously the, the light of events around Black Lives Matter and so forth and other risks and COVID have, 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 has, has shone, a, shone a light on some of these issues and, and how we how we work together across our partnerships to ensure that we um, are engaging and understand the issues for uh, groups with different protected characteristics and particular BAME groups. Um, and we've been through the group sharing a lot of information about how, um, how different partners are doing that. Um, for example, in how the police are, uh, are monitoring tensions during lockdown and, and, and looking at the perceptions of the response of public agencies throughout that. Um, so a lot of work, further work to be done on, on, on that uh, agenda, difficult and complex agenda. Uh, and then our, um, the, the final two priorities, if I may just quickly, is really a recognition across all of this partnership activity that the voluntary and community sector is facing as public services is facing uh, a very very difficult um, time during covid and in, obviously in the longer term um, particularly 
in terms of its financial position. Obviously, we've seen a huge and fantastic community response uh, during lockdown and a fantastic response by our partners um, from the Council for Voluntary Services, uh, from MIND, from uh, Citizens Advice, who we've been working closely with, for example. But I think there is a challenge um, that all partners um, are, are grappling with about how we continue to support um, those elements of the voluntary sector that are particularly focused on our most vulnerable, given that that activity is really critical to preventative work and, and safe communities. Uh, and finally, is around creating opportunities for all children to engage in positive activities and to build their aspiration. And uh, the work, obviously, during the last six and the focus around the last six months has been around ensuring that people can return to and attend and remain in school safely. Um, and, you know, and, and also looking at and sharing um, sharing the challenges of children's services with other partners um, around the, the rise and the spike um, beyond the initial COVID spike of social care uh, refer, um, referrals to children's services. Um, there's obviously been a reduction in activity during s school holidays over the, over the summer as children were largely at, at home. Um, there have been some, there has been some provisions, but that, that, that has been a challenge. So as we move beyond in, into next year, the focus is on how we can return to some of the preventative activity um, and with that further challenge of the lack of capacity or the reduced capacity in the voluntary sector. Those are, that's a flavour of the work that is going on through the group linked to the very wide range of collaborative partnerships that we have in Hampshire. Right, thank you very much, Robert, and thank you very much, Graham. Before I bring in Mike Westbrook, um, I think we all realise this is a huge subject and it's very important to our safety and well-being in, in Hampshire. And obviously it's, it's taken with utmost uh, seriousness. So the important thing for the committee is to know that you are dealing with, or you are certainly addressing serious organized crime, you're addressing uh, serious violence, knife crime, etc. You're addressing mental health and substance mis misuse, um, the radical extremism, inclusion and cohesion, vulnerable people, and creating opportunities for children. So really, uh, our job is to make sure that we agree that, that those are certainly your priorities. And secondly, is there anything we're missing? So Mike Westbrook, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, uh, Graham and Robert, for, for the reports. Um, under, priority three, under priority three mental health in the report, it talks about an unprecedented use of community treatment orders. I wonder if you could briefly, if you can, expand on what these are and how they work. Um, for those that don't know, <laughs> which includes me. Um, and the other point I had was under priority four, which Graham was talking about, about radical extremism. It talks in the report on, on page 46 about a sustained increase in referrals to the channel panel um, and relating to the younger age group. I, I wonder what, when you say younger age group, what age are we talking about? And that's my two main points. I did have one about volunteers, Chairman, but I think Robert's said what I was going to say in support of you know how wonderful volunteers have been, but maybe well, what we're going to do to help support volunteers in the future, because we don't want people to drop off because people are doing an awful lot. Um, um, but obviously I'll, I'll, I'll focus on those other two points if that's okay. Yeah, thank you. Perhaps if I, if I pick up on both of them. So firstly, a, a community treatment order. So a community treatment order follows from the application of the Mental Health Act. So somebody that has uh, a diagnosed mental health illness and requires a program of uh, support and treatment. It's usually a program of, of uh, support and treatment delivered by the formal NHS mental health services. So effectively, it's, it's, a, it's a formal order requiring somebody to comply with that treatment and support in order to hopefully uh, recover from the mental ill health that they're 
uh, afflicted by. That, that in a nutshell is it. I can go further and deeper if, if, help, if helpful, but that's effectively what, what, what it is. Uh, with regard to, to prevent uh, and numbers of referrals going into um, channel uh, and the age uh, range, we're, we're effectively uh, looking at uh, young people. So really from uh, the age of 14 up, who are being referred into uh, the channel process. And the channel process, as I said earlier, is a, a, a pre-criminalized uh, uh, intervention in effect, whereby uh, people may be uh, referred, young people and adults referred in terms of uh, expressing particular ideologies, uh, posting uh, materials on social media, or indeed elsewhere that gives rise for concern. And that con concern can come from any number of different places, whether that be a school, uh, family, friends, uh, or more formal routes in, in terms of police and, and other partners. And effectively the intervention there is, is designed hopefully uh, to challenge the ideologies that are being uh, uh, used or, or expressed by that individual. Um, where it gets tricky for me to, to answer beyond really much of what I've said, and, and I'm very conscious that clearly uh, this, this committee meeting is, is webcast. Uh, the data around prevent, and I'm sure members will, will understand, is official sensitive uh, and confidential in terms of, of numbers. What I can say is that we've seen uh, an increase again in the uh, last uh, financial year from the previous uh, financial year, and that's reflecting uh, a trend that is being seen across the whole of England. Um, and of the referrals going into Channel, 92% of them are, uh, are male, um, and uh, the majority, again, uh, are younger males, and the vast majority of those referrals are where individuals have expressed extreme right-wing ideologies an overwhelming number is around extreme right-wing belief or ideology that's being expressed. Um, Councillor Glenn, if, if it's helpful, given what I've said, that the, the, the data itself is, is official sensitive and I can't disclose it in a publicly webcast meeting, uh, we will be looking to bring forward in due course uh, briefings to share confidentially with members. Um, and if, if it's helpful for this committee, then there's certainly we will make that uh, available to you and to your committee members in due course. Uh, on that, I'll bring it back in in a minute, Mike. That would be very useful. And if you think, um, uh, Graham, that uh, that should be done as a sort of quick report to the committee at another PNR Select, we'll do it that way too. Um, it's useful to have uh, repetition on subjects is actually very useful because it does keep it fresh in our minds. So can we keep that as an option? Louise, can you make a note of that? Thank you. Um, I will do, Chairman. Yeah. Uh, back, back, back to you, Mike. No, just to say thank you, Graham, for that. Much, uh, much appreciated. Okay, uh, Adrian, Adrian Collett. Chairman, um, some very important priorities here, and and good work being done on all of these. I, I don't argue with any of them. I just wanted to ask on priority three, uh, the interconnected impacts of mental ill health and so on. Um, and it may be that neither Robert or Graham can, can help with this, but is the capacity of CAMS um, likely to be improved in any way, uh, bearing in mind the increased mental health challenges that have come from the COVID pandemic? Yeah. CAMS was always a very difficult challenge to get help from in the first place. Um, and it seems to me there's a desperate need for increased capacity there. Is anything happening on that front? Question. Yeah, so it's it's certainly a subject which has been exercised uh, within the Health and, and Adult Social Care Select Committee and, and Councillor Huck, Huckstep and his colleagues on that committee are very uh, keen to be hearing more about CAMS and indeed on the Children Select Committee as well. What I can say is there are further conversations taking place in terms of the capacity uh, across the county. What we've also had is, is views expressed by uh, NHS community health providers, so particularly Southern Health, and, and members will be aware that it's the Sussex Partnership Trust that currently deliver the variety of, uh, or, or the, the, the majority rather, 
of CAMS provision across the county of Hampshire at the moment. We've had some very positive uh, comments being made by the new chief executive, Ron Shields, at Southern Health, that he and Southern Health are very keen to provide additional support into the CAM service and indeed across a number of our acute uh, hospitals. Again, there is a willingness uh, to see a, a greater degree of partnership working that goes forward and goes into supporting CAM services across the county of Hampshire. So there are moves afoot. Beyond that, I can't really comment anymore. It's certainly an issue uh, that we're, we're very much focused on and an issue that I know that, that CCG partners as the commissioners of CAM services are putting a great deal of attention into currently. Thank you. Uh, Adrian? Uh, yes, th thank you for that. Um, obviously, that's something we will all need to keep a very close eye on. Um, can I just clarify for my own sake, uh, my own uh, confusion over health service structures? Uh, does Southern Health cover the whole of Hampshire or is the Frimley Park catchment area in any way separate? It's, it's different for different services. So essentially, Southern Health cover the whole of the county of Hampshire, with the exception of some services in terms of supporting people to leave Frimley Park Hospital and return back to their community. Those uh, re-enablement service or rehabilitation services are delivered through uh, Frimley Health. But in every other regard, um, Southern Health are covering the county of Hampshire. Thank you. That, that's very helpful. I feel somewhat justified in my confusion. <laughs> that's, your, that's age, Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> you got me back. <laughs> uh, Councillor Huckstep. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, it's clear that Hampshire County Council resources are being buffeted by COVID-19 and other factors. Uh, so there are always finite resources available for dealing with this particular area. I just wonder whether Hampshire County Council needs to be developing a line to take, should it be asked to take on children's services of our neighboring uh, area uh, of Southampton, where, as we know from news last night, uh, they've had eight very unsuccessful years of looking after children's services and we might be asked to to help and if that's the case uh, we need to be developing I think a, a strong line of whether we can say yes or no it's, sorry it's slightly outside this interesting ag point agenda item but I think it it, it it abuts it and we need to be thinking about it so from, from my perspective, and I'm sure uh, members of the committee will, will, will appreciate, I'm not best placed to, to comment uh, on the specifics of, of that particular point. What I would say is, is that Hampshire County Council's Children's Services and out, as an outstanding service, one of only two in the country to have outstanding across all domains of, of Ofsted, is, is currently a, a partner in practice in terms of improvement uh, that may be required in other children's services in other parts of the country. So uh, there is a, a track record, a proven track record in, in terms of that improvement journey that might uh, be required in, in other children's services uh, elsewhere. Uh, beyond that, I would, I would have to refer to uh, my colleague Steve Crocker and indeed uh, perhaps it might be an issue for, for the Children's Services Select Committee uh, in due course. Uh, Roger. Anything to uh, add, Roger? That's fine, that's fine Mr Chairman. I, I simply flagged up a possible pressure. Thank you. It's an interesting question, and without going into detail, uh, the County, Hampshire County Council Children's Services has an impeccable record in being able to help elsewhere. Uh, London comes to mind, and uh, we've always stood up to the plate and we've been ready to help other um, councils should they require it and should basically they be uh, asked to uh, take our help. So I'm quite certain, I have full confidence in our services being able to do that should the call come. Um, now other, this is your last chance everybody, any other comments, questions or debate on what we've been hearing? Councillor Withers is a question. I think, uh, was that somebody speaking? Yeah. Councillor yeah. Withers. Mr. Chairman, yeah, if I may briefly, yeah, um, 
It was just to thank you for an excellent report, but also to note that um, I've been working very closely with Vivid over uh, problems in our blocks of flats, particularly be between one and four o'clock in the morning. And I just want to say that um, within a couple of days, what an excellent response they've done to put additional lighting in known areas where drug pushers and users uh, have been doing their day to day work. Um, and we tend to forget sometimes about those people, particularly elderly, who go to work at three o'clock in the morning uh, to ASDA and that. And uh, I was really surprised by the excellent support that Vivid and the action that they've actually taken so quickly to rectify that lighting issue. And I just wanted to make members and yourself aware. I think that's just a comment, yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you, Councillor Withers. I, what I would say is I, I think that example absolutely underlines the work of, of the Community Safety Strategy uh, Group, which is about not doing all of the work as we sit, you know, as a committee, uh, hope, you know, hopefully we'll return to be able to sit as a committee in, in Ashburton Hall in due course. But it's, it's overseeing the work that's in place already and, and excellent work between uh, colleagues in, in housing uh, organisations and also district borough councils. Hampshire Constabulary and others to pick up on particularly those kinds of issues that you've, you've just referenced. So thank you. Yes, I'd, I'd like to pay tribute to our police liaison officers as well. I know the ones up in the northeast part of Hampshire have been working very hard, very proactive and are coming out with results, which is really good to see. People um, involved in the fair activities are being caught, which makes us feel a lot more secure. And that's what matters at the end of the day. Right, Bill, thank you very much for your uh, question. Are there any other any other hands? OK, now, what we'll do, we'll, whilst uh, Graham and Rob are there, can we go straight to the recommendation, which is we note the progress, the good progress of the work of the Hampshire Community Safety Strategy Group in establishing strategic community safety priorities for Hampshire and for overseeing effective multi-agency collaborative arrangements. And um, all, all happy to note that. Wave of hands, thumb in the air, shout agreed. OK, thank you very much indeed. And a big thank you to our officers, uh, uh, Robert and um, Graham, for the work you're doing and obviously the whole department. It's not just you two, I realise that. And we'll be very grateful to have you back again when actually either we need to do this next year or if you, Graham, believe it's time to give us what I would call um, important and uh, uh, information, which might be exempt, but we'd like yes, that. Indeed, Please thank you, so with Louise, will you? Okay. Right, you may leave. You are relieved of this onerous duty, gentlemen, and uh, we'll see you again. And thank ladies you. and gentlemen, we're about to come into the end of the meeting. We have to go through the work, not go through it, but I commend the work program to you. Um, it's there for you to see. I present, we present it to you. There are things coming up. Um, if you, as someone did at the last meeting, want to remind us of anything that we're missing out, such as we'd like to listen to the LEP program again, we bring, we'll bring it in, OK? It's your committee, not mine. And um, we would uh, uh, like to commend that to you. If, if you want to talk about the work program, please raise a hand now. But I'm quite certain that most of you want to get away because the sun is now shining. Chairman, it, it's yes. Louise. Can I just add, um, just point members to the additional item on the end, which is the broadband matters, whereby a report is going to be given to you in March, updating you on the gigabit voucher, gigabit voucher scheme and the F20 voucher scheme, which I think is a scheme that's replacing the former one. So that was that, just to advise Councillor Porter, because I think she asked for it at the last meeting. Yes, she did. Right. It's a good example of um, committee members get putting, uh, uh, arranging input, which is really vital to the uh, uh, keeping our our presentations current. Uh, right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that's it for the morning. I'm very grateful to you for all attending. Thank you to the cabinet members for staying, um, and uh, I look forward to uh, uh, seeing you all again in about three months' time. We will see each other, but have a good Christmas. <laughs>